Hi all, welcome to GMAT Points videos. I am Saili Kale. In this particular video, we have put together 50 good quality GMAT verbal questions. You have 30 questions from sentence correction, 10 questions from reading comprehension and 10 questions from critical reasoning. We have put together uh, 50 good quality questions with like uh, good uh, video solutions as such. So that if you are looking for what kind of questions come in GMAT, what are the uh, type of verbal questions that come in GMAT, this would be a good place to start. We, the questions are uh, exactly representative of what actually comes in the GMAT exam. They are of different difficulty levels and essentially this would be the right place to start to understand what kind of questions you have to prepare for in the GMAT exam. So best of luck. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT Points videos. I am Saili Kale. In this particular video, we have a uh, question about phrasing a uh, sentence which has multiple modifier phrases. So whenever you have modifier phrases, you have to be very very careful that the modifier is close to the object that it is modifying. So for example, if I say that uh, speak quietly, I have to put quietly close to the verb that it is modifying. So I have to put it close to speak. But if I say speak uh, in the room quietly, it does not make sense because now quietly is next to in the room and then it does not make sense because it is not close to the action or the object that it is modifying. In this case, you have multiple modifiers and you have to be very careful that they are close to the object that they are modifying. So let us take a look at the sentence. Having finished the crossword puzzle, the newspaper was tossed aside by my grandma who was sitting in her favorite armchair. Now essentially what is one of the uh, phrases that is modifying having finished the crossword puzzle. So who is this modifying? Who has finished the crossword puzzle? Grandma has finished the crossword, crossword puzzle. So this is a modifier uh, which is acting on the object grandma which is over here. So it has to be close to the uh, object that it is modifying which is grandma over here. Similarly who was sitting in the armchair in her favorite armchair again this part over here is referring to grandma. So even this has to be close to the uh, object as such. We see that this is close to the object but this part, this modifier is far away from the object which makes it a dangling modifier. A dangling modifier is a modifier which is not uh, in any way attached to the object that it is modified. Having finished the crossword puzzle, my grandma should be in the next word so that we know that that uh, the crossword puzzle was finished by grandma. So essentially having finished the crossword puzzle should in some way be very close to my grandma and so should this part which is who was sitting in her favorite armchair. So let us see which of the options actually fixes this error of dangling and misplaced modifiers. So let's take a look at the first option. So having finished the crossword puzzle, the same issue is over here. It is the same sentence, so we can eliminate this. Here it makes it seem as if the newspaper had finished the crossword puzzle, which it doesn't make sense. Immediately after this modifier, you should have my grandma or my uh, grandma or in some way, it should be very close to the person who actually did the crossword puzzle. So A can be eliminated. My, gr my grandma tossed aside the newspaper having finished the crossword puzzle. Again, this has to be close to grandma. Because the newspaper did not finish the crossword puzzle. Who was sitting in a fa favorite armchair? Again, who was sitting in the favorite armchair? Was the crossword puzzle sitting in the favorite armchair? No. So both of these are in fact incorrectly placed. So in the first sentence, one modifier was correctly placed, one was incorrectly placed. In this, both are incorrectly placed. So clearly can be rejected. Option C is having finished the crossword puzzle, my grandma who was sitting in her favorite armchair tossed aside the newspaper. This is close to my grandma, this is next to my grandma. So both modifiers are next to the object they are modifying, neither of them is misplaced. So this is the right answer. Let us take a look at options D and E as well. My grandma have, had finished the crossword puzzle sitting in her favorite armchair and tossing aside the newspaper. Who did this? What is uh, this modified? Sitting in, uh, in her armchair, who was sitting in the armchair? Was the crossword puzzle sitting in the armchair? No. So since this is modifier modifying grandma, it should be next to grandma. So again, misplaced modify. The last one, the newspaper having finished the crossword puzzle. Did the newspaper finish the crossword puzzle? No. So it should not be in that way. Uh, whenever you put something like in a sub clause like having finished it, it indicates that uh, that clause is modifying what uh, the subject that came just before it. So in this case, you are trying to indicate that the crossword puzzle was finished by the newspaper, which does not make sense. So E also can be eliminated. The correct answer is option C. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT points video series. 
In this particular question, we have a sentence correction question which requires us to find the correct way of phrasing the underlined part. So, let's take a look at the sentence. In a review of 500 research papers published between 2010 and 2015, a group of scientists argued that the lack of control for gender and age made the findings of most of the studies questionable. So, they are basically saying that uh, that the lack of control made uh, the lack of control for uh, gender and age essentially would make uh, the uh, studies results uh, not reliable as such. So, essentially I see no grammatical error in the sentence as is. So, if the sentence is grammatically correct as is, I would say the correct answer would be option A. But also see, let us see whether options B, C, D and E are also grammatically correct or grammatically incorrect. So, let us take a look at option B. Scientists argued that the lack of control for variables such as gender and age made the findings of most of the studies questionable. So, there is no grammatical error over here, but the addition of such as gender and age essentially changes the meaning of the sentence. The original sentence basically uh, pointed only two factors that is that of gender and age. When you say such as gender and age, it indicates that there were more factors. For example, gender and age were two of the many factors that they failed to control for. But it's not that the uh, that's not the case in the given sentence. In the given sentence, there, there are only two factors that are mentioned. So B, because it changes the meaning of the actual sentence, we can eliminate option B. Uh, so, uh, scientists argued that most of the studies fail to control for variables such as gender and age making their findings questionable. So, this making their findings questionable firstly is awkward construction because uh, you are uh, making converting it into a modifier and it is not clear what it is mo modifying making their findings questionable. Are the scientists findings questionable or the studies questionable? It is difficult to understand because Essentially, this part has been made into a modifier and it should not be a modifier because it because it is a modifier, we are not clear what it is modifying as such. So, it should not be in a modifier form like this. So, C is also incorrect. Scientists argued that uh, having failed to control for variables like gender and age in most of the studies made their findings questionable. So, it is not that uh, having failed to control for variables in most of their studies. So, basically here you when you uh, the tense construction is kind of awkward because you use having failed, you use a past uh, perfect form. Whenever you are using the past perfect form, you are kind of trying to say that uh, something else which happened after that uh, made their uh, uh, results uh, questionable. But the results are questionable in present term because it is now that we are saying that they are questionable as such. So, it is not something that happened in the past but is not true anymore or it is something that uh, got over in the past. The results are questionable today. So, the use of part, past participle form is incorrect. So, the tense uh, is uh, tense of this particular sentence is incorrect and it is not correct as per the meaning given in the uh, original sentence as such. The tense change it does is not consistent with the meaning implied by the given sentence. So, D is also incorrect. Scientists argued that the findings of most of the studies that fail to control for variables like gender and age were questionable. So, it is not that uh, it is uh, that fail to control if you have that firstly you should not have these uh, uh, commas. When you use which which fail to control then you can put which in commas like this. But if you have that, there should be no comma. So, just because of that simple grammatical error also, I can eliminate option E. The correct option has to be option A. The given sentence is grammatically correct. There is no grammatical error in the given sentence. So, that means the correct answer is option A. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT Points video series. In this particular video, we have a simple parallel construction question uh, in uh, on sentence correction. So, let us take a look at the question. When Darwin first published his works on evolution, the naturalists were divided between those who believed that species did not change genetically or physically from the time they were first created with those who, who welcomed da Darwin's plausible and compelling explanation of how species evolve. So, essentially uh, you are saying that once his work was published, the naturalists were divided into two groups X and Y. Okay. So, the X group is those who believe that species do not change genetically or physically from when they were first created and the others who believe that uh, who others who welcomed his uh, plausible and compelling explanation for how species evolve. But essentially when you are saying that there are two groups X and Y, the connector that you have to use has to be and. Over here the connector that was used is with. When you are saying compare A with B, you can use with. When you are saying A with B, if you use compare, 
But if you say split into two, then you have to say A and B with the use of preposition with is incorrect. So, because of that, I can eliminate option A. Similarly, over here also we have with for the same reason we can eliminate option B. Species do not change genetically or physically from the time they were first created and and is the right conjunction to use in this case. So, I would say this is correct. From the time they were first created, species did not change genetically or physically against. Against again also does not mean because here you are saying two groups were formed, not A against B, but rather two, uh, the split happened and there were two groups formed A and B. So, again against is also incorrect. Species did not change genetically or physically uh, from time they were created or again, when you have, uh, when you split a group into two parts which have opposing beliefs, it is not A or B, okay. It is not that, okay, they were graduates or postgraduates or physicists and bio or biologists where there could be a possible overlap. There were people who were critical of him and there were people who were, uh, who welcomed him. There can be no overlap between these two groups. So, or cannot be the conjunction used. The only conjunction that is valid is and and that is in option C. So, the correct answer is option C. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT points video series. In this particular sentence correction question, we have a simple question based on the correct format of using not only but also or not as but as. So, whenever you have not x but x, uh, there is a specific uh, construction format that has to be followed. Remember that whatever is there after not, similarly the same format should be followed after but. So, if you have a specific way of phrasing this part, the same way of phrasing has to be followed in the other part also. So, let us take a look at the uh, this. Some economists considered the spiking mortgage refinancing last quarter not as an indicator of financial hardship, instead a reflection of uh, homeowners belief in their ability to make timely payments. See firstly, if it is not, uh, not only then it should be but also, if it is not as then it should be but as, it can't be not as an instead, that is not a valid construction of a sentence. Uh, you have to, whenever you are doing this uh, not A but B, uh, that is the only valid way of using the negative uh, uh, negative format as such. You, if you start uh, saying not A, it has to be followed by, with but B, there is no not and instead, that, uh, that particular format does not make sense. So, instead can directly be eliminated, instead does not work neither does yet work. It has to be only not and but. So, D can also be eliminated for the same reason. So, let us take a look at option B, but a reflection of confidence in homeowners in their ability in making. Firstly, it is the homeowners belief that they can meet the uh, timely payments. It is not confidence in the homeowners in their ability. It is not somebody else's confidence. B changes the meaning and it also has an awkward construction as such. So, because of that, I can eliminate option B. But as a reflection of homeowners belief in their ability to make, this is exactly the case, not as x, but as x and it has grammatically correct construction. So, because but as is over there, it has it is the right way of forming the sentence. So, this would be the correct sentence, but also is not correct. If it was not only, then it would be but also and when you use not only, but also you are saying not only a, but also b, both are adding. When you say not a, but b. You are saying that this is not true, this is true. When you use not only and but also, it means both are true. In this case, you are saying that it was not this, but this. So, first uh, factor is not true, the second factor is true. So, the not only but also is not in the case. So, C is the right option. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT Points video series. I am Saili Kale. In this particular sentence correction question, we have a simple question based on two very simple concepts, subject verb agreement and parallelism. So, let us take a look at those concepts and let us take a look at the question. Innovative marketing strategies and service streamlining has allowed the e-learning firm to greatly increase its monthly sales and in reducing its operational glitches. So, whenever you have two things that are mentioned, A and B. If A and B is mentioned, innovative marketing strategies and service streamlining, it essentially becomes a combined plural uh, subject. When you have a plural subject, the verb also has to be plural. So, in this case, you cannot use has, you have to use its plural form have. So, using this fact that you cannot use the singular has, I can eliminate option A, option B and option D because all of them has uh, have the singular verb has, so they can be eliminated. So, we are left with options C and E. So, have allowed the e-learning firm, e firm, have allowed the e-learning firm. 
So let us take a look at the rest of the part. To greatly increase its monthly sales as well as reducing or to greatly increase its monthly sales and to reduce. Now remember whenever you are saying A and B, whenever you are making a list, okay, if you are making a list of also this and this, whenever you are also using a, uh, uh, a kind of a list format as such, you have to make sure that the two, uh, two or three or how many elements are there in that list have the same format as such. So if in this case, if you have increased its monthly uh, sales, it is in the simple present tense, then this part should also be in the simple present tense. In this case, it is in the continuous format. So it cannot be the case. This is simple present. This is simple present. So E is the right answer. There is tense inconsistency in option C. The correct answer is option E. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT points video series. I'm Saili Kale. In this particular video, we'll be taking a look at a sentence correction question. Whenever we have sentence correction questions, especially asking us to find out which uh, particular option has uh, correctly phased a uh, underlined sentence, we'll try as much as possible to using the split method. In the split method, we'll consider all the options and how they have particular uh, phased different parts of the given sentence. See, remember in the long sentence that is given, there are only two, three key points that you have to actually consider. Uh, you have to choose the correct combination for each of those crucial points as such. For example, consider this statement. We'll just read the statement first. The complex arrangement of the human heart having four chambers and an intricate uh, network of blood vessels help uh, explain why physicians have theorized that it evolved to optimize blood flow. So if you see the options also, there are many options which have repeated uh, parts of the sentences as such. So let me actually uh, consider them in different parts. So the first part is having four chambers and an intricate network of blood vessels. That is the first part. This one is with four chambers and a network of blood vessels. Uh, then you have uh, having four chambers as well as an intricate, intricate disc. So having four as well as these are the first options. These are the options that we have for phrasing this part of the sentence. Having four chambers connected to an intricate. So this is there are four ways of phrasing the first part as such, connected. So always remember whenever you are choosing, whatever option that you choose should not change or alter the meaning of the original sentence that is given. So whenever you see anything where you have connection or something extraneous given which is not part of the original sentence, you should be careful that it should not alter the meaning of the sentence that is given. So that is the first part as such. Now there are changes in this verb as well. So you have help, help, helps, helps and help. Okay, so there are two ways you can have helps or help as such. So let us actually instead of writing all of these things, I will just con uh, narrow it down to two possibility, help or helps as such. Now consider the last part, explain why physicians, explain why physicians, explain why physicians, explain why physicians. So there is no change over there. The last change is over this particular part, which is has or have. So essentially we have four choices over here. We have two choices over here and two choices over here. If you uh, select which is the wrong choice or remove the wrong choices, it would help us in removing the options which are clearly incorrectly phased as such. Now let us consider because you have fewer choices over here and here. Let us try to figure out which is the right verb to choose. Is it help or helps? Is it has or have? That will help us remove uh, some of the incorrect uh, phrasings as such. So in this case, what is this verb for? Help and helps. The complex arrangement of the heart helps or does it help? So the complex arrangement of the human heart is a singular subject. It is the complex arrangement refers to a singular idea as such. Because it is a singular noun, it should take a singular verb. There should be singular to singular uh, subject verb agreement, which means that in help is a plural form of the verb. We should use helps. So help is incorrect, you should have helps because the complex arrangement of the human heart, the human heart itself is singular, but the complex uh, arrangement of the human heart is also singular. It is not a plural, uh, plural subject as such. So that basically means that you should use helps and not help. So if you would say that it is helps, then you can remove option A, it can, you can remove option B, you can remove option uh, D as, E as well. So A, B and E have been removed just by this particular choice as such. Now let us consider you have uh, in C and D you have have and has and have as such. 
uh, in this case what is it uh, referring to has is the singular verb have is the plural verb in this case has and have essentially refer to physicians physicians as a group is a plural uh, uh, plural noun as such physicians uh, are uh, divided on this physicians recommend uh, 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 doing this so always it takes a it is a plural noun and it takes a plural verb which means between has and have have is the correct answer has is incorrect physicians are plural noun so that basically means that this part this one which has has can also be eliminated so since a c e and b can be eliminated we will say that d is the right answer so using just these two choices we could find the right answer as such among the given the first choices having four chambers and an integrated network of blood vessels this is grammatically correct there is no difference in it with four chambers and a network of blood vessels also grammatically correct there is no uh, this in it having four chambers as well this should be well as an intricate network of blood vessels again it is a uh, valid gram grammatically valid construction there is no issue with it with four chambers again grammatically valid having four chambers connected to an intricate network of uh, uh, blood vessels this i would eliminate because this is not there in the original construction and this then changes or alters the meaning of the sentence so e in that case can be eliminated but we don't really need to do that also just using the verbs using subject verb agreement i could uh, arrive at the correct answer as such always remember if you try to split it according to the different choices that you have to make or which parts you have to actually choose on sometimes making the simpler choices makes it uh, completely unnecessary to make even the complicated choices this part was complicated but it was completely unnecessary to do because you could have gotten to one correct option just using the uh, simpler choices to make as such so using option elimination and use focusing on the simpler subject verb agreement concept you could have easily found the given uh, answer as such Hi friends, welcome to GMAT Points video series. I am Saili Kale. In this particular video, we are taking a look at a sentence. Uh, we are uh, finding out uh, the correct way of phrasing the underlined part. So as always, as I recommend for these kind of questions, we will try to split the options along the differences that they have, relative differences that are there across the different options. So first, let's take a look at the sentence. The neighbors were certain that a fire has broken out as they saw the thick smoke billowing from the window. So we have that... Uh, they knew already that some uh, fire has broken out because they saw thick smoke billowing from the window. Now let us take a look at the options. Were certain that a fire has broken out as they saw. So here you have were which is different. Here you are are certain. Here again were certain, are certain, were certain. So were and are are the two options as such. That a fire has broken out. That a fire is breaking out. That a fire had broken out. That a fire broke out. So you have broken out, has broken out, has broken out as one of the options, is breaking out as one of the options, had broken out as one of the options, broke out as one of the options and again has broken out again uh, as the first sentence. Uh, so broke out is the fourth option. So these are the four options that are there for the middle part and then you have as they saw, as they see, as they saw, as they saw, as they see. So you have the option between saw and see. Before we actually proceed any further, let us take a look at uh, what this question is about. This question is about tense consistency and there are multiple tenses that are there in this particular paragraph and we have to choose the correct tense format. Are and were are basically two different forms of were is simple past, are is simple present. Has broken out is basically present perfect form of uh, uh, the uh, verb. Had broken out is past perfect form of the verb. Is breaking out is present continuous. Broke out is simple past. So essentially we have to choose the correct tense format. Before we choose the correct tense format, let's get a sense of what the sentence is and when did it occur. So if you see the sentence, uh, if you consider the tense or tenses of the particular sentence, let's try to make a sense of when did each of those uh, incidents occur. So here is when the neighbors saw it. Neighbors knew something. So what did they knew? They knew that uh, they were certain that there was a fire had broken out. So they knew the point at which they would know. For them to know, they have to see the smoke. So uh, they see smoke has to be at some point before uh, them knowing. 
and before the smoke the fire has to break out so if i see for me to know something it should have occurred at some point in the past and the cause or whatever the symptom should have occurred the cause of that symptom should have occurred even further down the past for me to see the smoke it should have occurred the smoke should start billowing at some point of time in the past and for that smoke to below the fire should have actually occurred sometime even before that so that basically means that uh, if i saw this if i i am certain uh, if the neighbors are certain right now then it means they are seeing the smoke right now so they are seeing so you can say the neighbors are certain because they see the smoke and therefore if they see the smoke the fire has already started so you can say they are certain they see the smoke and the fire has already started as uh, has broken out that is one valid construction this r has broken out and see the other valid construction is that they were certain and if they were certain that would mean they saw the smoke uh, billowing out and they saw the smoke billowing out because the fire had already started because if this is occurring in the past they were certain then you have to use the past perfect form you are going one step this is in the past then this has to be past perfect if this is in the present then this has to be present perfect so the fire breaking out has to be in the perfect tense because it should predate them seeing uh, it should come before them seeing and knowing as such so is breaking uh, so is breaking out is uh, clearly wrong broke out is also clearly wrong because it has to be in the perfect tense format as such therefore you have has broken out or had broken out so we can have were had broken out and saw there are two options essentially you have Uh, were certain a uh, fire this is incorrect has broken out is incorrect because if they were certain the uh, fire should have already had broken out so this should had broken out is would have been the right format uh, past tense present perfect doesn't work together in that case are certain a fire is breaking out is breaking out continuous form does not make sense over here were certain that a fire had broken out as they saw also makes sense Uh, are certain that a fire broke out no simple past doesn't make sense it has to be past perfect ha are certain that a fire has broken out as they see were certain that a fire broke uh, has broken out as they see if they were certain then it should be uh, uh, essentially it should be has uh, are certain then has broken out should be uh, can be valid but again if even if you had are certain and a fire has broken out the original sentence were certain so when you change from were certain to are certain you are changing the meaning of the sentence you are now shifting the sentence that was situated in the past to now it being situated in the present as such if you see most of the sentence is situated in the past you can't change it to are certain uh, has broken out etc so the only sentence which is grammatically correct and is consistent in meaning with the sentence that was given is they were certain because a fire had broken out as they saw the smoke billowing out so the correct answer is option c remember something whenever you are uh, having multiple things happening okay you should write down the uh, 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 write down the sentence as a line timeline uh, the neighbor seeing the smoke and knowing that the fire has broken out can be at the same time because you see and you immediately infer as such so there need not be a jump over here but the fire has to proceed in a way it has to be a step back in time and because it has to be a step back in time it should be at a tense which is earlier than when they are seeing things and also you have to preserve the tense as is being described in the given sentence so the only one that actually does that is option c hi friends welcome to gmat points video series i'm saili kale in this particular uh, video we'll be discussing the simple dangling modifiers question the dangling modifiers concept is super simple whatever modifier is there at the start of the sentence when you see it there's a modifier at the start of the sentence separated by a comma that dangling modifier has to be immediately next to the object or subject it is modifying it should not be separated from that particular thing so in this case let us take a look at the uh, sentence regarded as allegorical yet precise accounts at times historians have debated ancient scrolls for ages now let's take a look at the modifier regarded as allegorical yet precise account at accounts at times so what is this referring to this is referring to some document as such for it to be al allegorical but a precise account that basically means it is referring to some notes some accounts some written document essentially so can historians be a written document no so historians cannot be the subject or object that they are modifying which means that 
it has to be either ages or ancient scrolls ages are not a document so only ancient scrolls is a apt object to actually take that particular modifier which means that this uh, particular dangling modif mo this is a case of a dangling modifier because it is next to historians instead of the object that is actually modifying so essentially this has to be shifted over here so you should have regarded as allegorical yet precise account at times ancient scrolls and then the rest of the sentence since it is ancient scroll should come first we have to change the rest of the sentence from active voice to passive voice so ancient scrolls have been debated by historians for ages as such so now let us take a look at the options historians have debated no ancient scrolls has to be pushed up so this can be eliminated historians have been debating no ancient scrolls should be at the front because that has to be next to that modifier as such so b also can be eliminated ancient scrolls have been a subject of debate by historians for ages grammatically correct it pushes ancient scrolls up so i would say this is the right answer ages have been no ages is not the object it is modifying can eliminate d also ancient scrolls so this part is right ancient scrolls have debated by historians for ages have debated is incorrect you should ha say have been debated when you are converting it from active voice to passive voice you have to say uh, is being or has been or have been as such you have to add the is being kind of uh, auxiliary verb to the verb that is there so uh, ancient scrolls have been debated as such so because been is missing over here e is also incorrect c would be the right answer Hi friends, welcome to GMAT Points video series. I am Saili Kale. In this particular sentence correction question, we have to find out the right way of phrasing the underlined sentence. So let's take a look at the uh, uh, sentence first. The new safety regulations for the construction in, uh, industry, if they are implemented by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, will cause there to be more workers to wear protective gear on job sites. So always whenever we have sentences like this, I always say that split them up, up according to the choices that you have. So first is if they are implemented by this, 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 if implemented, if the occupy implements them, if implemented by, if the, this implements them. So there are two ways, one is if they are implemented, if implemented, if dash implements them. This is again if implemented, uh, if dash implements them. So these are the three choices that are there for the first part. Now let's take a look at the second part which is after the uh, comma as such. Will cause there to be more workers to wear. So this is will cause there. And uh, last part is where, wor workers to wear as such, to wear. Then you have would cause more workers to wear, would cause. To wear then you are cause there to be more workers wearing cause there workers wearing and then causes a rise causes a rise causes a rise in workers wearing so wearing is a common so i'll not write it again causes a rise will cause a rise will cause so if you see uh, there are certain uh, additions which are completely not needed in each of the options as such. If you see if they are implemented or if implemented, uh, since you would use the pronoun they if it is difficult to figure out uh, if there is like a break in the sentence or if there is a uh, uh, there is a lot of confusion, then you uh, repeat the subject using the pronoun. But the subject new regulations are just given over here. There is absolutely no need to uh, like remind it by using a pronoun as such. So the use of they are is completely unnecessary over here. The subject is right here. The new regulations are just right here. There is absolutely no need to repeat it using the pronoun as such. So this is in fact awkward con uh, construction. You uh, can directly say if implemented by the uh, this or if the uh, this implements them. Both are fine as such. Essentially first is a direct uh, form of or direct uh, uh, active voice if implemented by uh, this uh, or if this implements them again implements them is uh, slightly awkward construction not needed but still those are valid the first one is incorrect because there is no need for adding the pronoun there no need for the repetition of the pronoun there let's see will cause these would cause this cause these causes a rise etc see essentially when you are saying if 
it has to be followed by will something will cause or would cause as such this is a hypothetical situation and whenever you are using a hypothetical situation you have to use the verb format of will cause would cause uh, can cause or some uh, the hypothetical format is of that sort you will not you cannot use cause or causes arise because uh, because it is a hypothetical situation you would have to indicate that this can cause something this would cause something you cannot start uh, you cannot directly use cause or causes as such so because of that we can eliminate these two choices so this cause there to be more workers wearing is incorrect causes to be is incorrect because whenever you have a hypothetical situation that this if this happens then that happens then you have to use would cause or will cause or can cause to indicate the fact that this is a hypothetical uh, statement construction so i can eliminate option c and d directly now again you have will cause would cause as such so if this is implemented this would uh, you would say that uh, again let us also take a look at will cause or would cause let us uh, wait for now should it be to wear or wearing as such uh, will cause a work rise in workers wearing if you are saying will cause a rise in workers wearing uh, the protective gear to job sites it basically means that uh, the sentence originally means that uh, more workers will have to wear the protective gear but if you say that there will be a rise in workers wearing the protective gear it means that the number of workers might rise so when you say rise in workers wearing you are now modifying the uh, number of workers as such so the change of the uh, so the meaning of the sentence is being changed so e essentially when you put wearing it actually changes the meaning of the sentence so this is clearly incorrect it will not cause a rise in the workers wearing but it will cause more people who are currently working to actually wear the protective gear so e is incorrect now let us see which is, which should it be will cause there to be more workers to wear or would cause more workers now here there is another thing that you have to uh, consider there will cause there to be more workers is there uh, any need for there to be there to there to be this entire phrase that is there is extremely awkward construction it is not needed you can directly say that this uh, will cause more workers to wear protective gear on the side or would cause more workers to wear protective gear on the both are valid but this there to be is invalid it is not necessary it is an uh, it is a basically awkward construction which is completely not needed as such you can say in the new safety regulations for the construction industry will cause uh, more workers to wear protective gear on job sites uh, this but again it is if implemented so it because it is uh, if it is implemented it go, shifts the tense to the past format then you have to use would cause if uh, if the occupational uh, safety and health administra uh, administration implements them then you will say will cause so if uh, this part is there if it is implement if it implements them if it is in simple present tense then you will say will cause if it implemented is there then you say would cause so because of that from tense consistency also you can eliminate option a the correct answer is option b and against the presence of there to be is an unnecessary awkward construction because of that also you can eliminate option a so through option elimination i can say that option b is the right choice if implemented as the simple clean way of putting the first part would cause the it would be the right way of using the verb in a hypothetical scenario and to wear is the right way wearing indicates or changes the meaning of the sentence so from the choices that we have b is the right choice to make hi friends welcome to gmat points video series in this particular sentence correction question we have to find the right way of phrasing the underlying part of the sentence so let's take a look at the sentence announced on the first monday of every month and covering the previous month the ministry of education's enrollment statistics reveal uh, reveals the amount of students enrolled in schools and universities so again as we have already done we always split according to the options or choices that we have in the different options so you have reveals revealed reveal reveal reveals so three options are there reveals reveal and revealed as such then the other choice is amount of students number of students amount of students number of students so either it is amount of or number of that is the second choice that we have to make and schools and universities is same uh, throughout so there are only two choices to make whether it should be reveals or it should be revealed or should it be revealed amount of number of now firstly we know that this is something that occurs every uh, first of every month as such first monday of every month so since this is a ongoing thing since this is a periodical thing we have to use simple present tense you cannot use past tense for something that occurs periodically you can't say that the sun 
rose uh, yesterday because the sun rises every day because it rises every day you cannot use the past tense for something that occurs every single day or occurs periodically as such so because this occurs every single month you have to say uh, use the simple tense for the verb as such so revealed is definitely incorrect now between reveals and revealed this is basically the difference between singular noun and plural noun if the subject is singular you should use reveals if the uh, subject is plural you should use uh, reveal as such so in this case what is the subject enrollment statistics is the subject enrollment statistics essentially uh, indicates a bunch of numbers now a bunch of numbers enrollment statistics uh, if you say the, the statistics are uh, clearly uh, suggesting x if you see statistics is a plural noun especially when you are saying the enrollment statistics these are a plural noun as such announced on the first days covering the every month and covering the previous month this together is a plural noun as such so that means it should not take reveals it should take reveal so the correct choice to be made over here is reveal again when you have number of students and amount of students uh, you use amount of when it is an uncountable noun so amount of uh, say amount of water this is a larger amount of water this is a lesser amount of time greater uh, larger amount of water uh, lesser amount of water uh, more time less time uh, more amount of time less amount of time so time and water are uncountable nouns so you would use amount in that case when you have countable nouns like uh, students enrolled in schools and universities you can count how many students are enrolled in that case you should use number and not amount as such so amount is incorrect number would be the right choice so let us rem remove reveals revealed revealed and uh, this so two options are there amount of number of amount of is incorrect number of is correct so the right option is option uh, e reveal the number of students enrolled in schools and universities so the correct answer is option e hi friends welcome to gmat points videos i'm saili kale in this particular video we'll be taking a look at a reading comprehension set the reading comprehension set the passage is fairly readable and it is on a topic most of you would understand and can relate to so let's take a look at the passage roughly a century ago a new fad diet began to sweep the united states hollywood starlets such as ethel barrymore supposedly swore by it the citrus industry hopped on board all a figure conscious girl had to do was eat a lot of grapefruit for a week or two or three. So this is the introduction to the fat diet which involved eating a lot of grape, uh, just eating a lot of grapefruit for a few weeks. So intro to fat diet, which is basically eating grapefruits. Now let's take a look at the next paragraph. The grapefruit diet, like pretty much all other fat diets, is mostly bunk. If people were losing weight with the regimen, that's because the citrus was being recommended as part of a portion control, low calorie, low carbohydrate diet, not because it had exceptional flab blasting powers. And yet the diet has survived through the decades, spawning a revival in the 1970s and 80s, a dangerous juice exclusive spin-off called Grapefruit Fast, and even a shout out from Weird Al, its hype still plagues nutritionists today. So this is a mostly a bunk diet. There is no real scientific uh, reasoning behind it. Even if it actually helps you lose weight, it's because of the fact that it is part of a calorie control diet. The calorie control and the other weight uh, diet restrictions essentially help you lose weight, not the grapefruit itself. But it has somehow survived uh, through the decades and even is relevant today as such. And uh, it is something that uh, uh, like hurts like haunts nutritionist uh, to today's uh, date as such. So this fat diet, not scientific, yet has survived, yet has survived for decades, continues to cause issues today. Now let's take a look at the last paragraph. But for every grapefruit evangelist, there is a critic warning of its dangers, probably one with a background in pharmacology. The fruit for all its tastiness and dietetic appeal has another more sinister trait. It raises the level of dozens of FDA approved ma medications in the body. And for a select few drugs, the amplification can be the potent enough trigger to, uh, uh, to trigger a life threatening overdose. 
For most people, chowing down on grapefruit is completely safe. It would take a perfect storm of factors, say a vulnerable person taking a especially grapefruit sensitive medication with a, within a certain uh, window of drinking a particular amount of grapefruit juice for disaster to unfurl, says Emily Heil, an infectious disease pharmacist at the University of Maryland. But that leaves grapefruit in a bit of a weird position. No one can agree on exactly how much the world should worry about this bittersweet treat whose chemical properties scientists still don't fully understand. So essentially, there are people who are warning that, you know, there are potential risks associated with grapefruit. And the risks are basically that it has a tendency to amplify the dosages of certain medications and it could potentially trigger a uh, overdose of certain life-threatening medications as such. Certain uh, approved medications, if they if you increase their level or dosage to too high a level, they can be life-threatening. And there are certain medications like that which can be impacted by taking grapefruit as such. So it is not something that is going to be like very likely to happen. You would have to have a vulnerable patient who is taking a uh, medication that would actually respond to grapefruit and would have to eat grapefruit within a time window surrounding his particular consumption of that medication. So a lot of factors are involved and uh, if all of those factors come together, it could potentially uh, trigger a life-threatening situation. So it's not as if it is like risky in general, but under certain conditions, it can be very risky as such. And like if there's a perfect storm, if all these uh, conditions are perfectly converge, then there can be a dangerous situation that can emerge as such. But essentially, it's not, it is not dangerous as such, but can be dangerous under certain conditions. So this leaves you in a kind of a uh, middle uh, place, neither here nor there. It's not as if grapefruit is a bad fruit, it is a good fruit, but under certain conditions, under certain uh, situations, it could be a dangerous fru uh, fruit as such. So it leaves you in exactly like a, uh, uh, you uh, you don't know exactly where you are because partly also uh, resulting from the fact that uh, scientists don't know exactly how it uh, behaves, they don't fully understand the fruit as such. So essentially, under specific conditions, consumption of grapefruit can be dangerous. But those are very small, uh, essentially not a small set of cases, but a uh, specific uh, cases only. So essentially, under certain cases, you should not be taking a lot of grapefruit as such. If you're not taking any uh, medication which responds to it, then it's fine to eat as much grapefruit you want. So it's not a dangerous fruit in itself, but if you are taking medication, then you have to be careful as such. So it leaves it in a... Uh, so slightly dangerous but not dangerous in itself as such, slightly risky under certain conditions or rather not slightly risky, it is risky uh, or it is uh, dangerous uh, under certain, uh, in certain cases, in specific cases. So now that we understand what the passage is about, let's take a like overall view about the passage. So the first passage starts off by t talking about or introducing the grapefruit diet. It bunks and says that this uh, there is no scientific evidence that the grapefruit diet actually helps you lose weight. If it does lose, help you lose weight, it is because of the because it is part of other calorie controls, and those calorie controls are essentially helping you lose weight. The grapefruit has no uh, weight loss properties as such, but you have to be careful about it. Has no the grapefruit diet has no positives but it has a certain risk involved. And what is that risk involved? The grapefruit has chemical properties of tending to amp up certain medications uh, uh, effect on human beings. And certain of those like uh, certain that amping up effect can be fatal in certain cases as such. So there is no upside to the grapefruit diet, but under certain cases, if there's a perfect storm of conditions, it could be potentially life threatening as such. So there is no real upside, but under specific cases, it could have a significant downside as such. So the author begins by debunk debunking the grapefruit diet and he also highlights a potential concern, a potential uh, dangerous issue related to overconsumption or consumption of grapefruit as such. So now that we understand uh, the point of the or the message of the paragraph, now we can take a look at the questions. We understand exactly what he is trying to say. There is no upside to it. 
but under certain conditions there is a significant downside to it okay so now that you understand the message let's take a look at the questions the primary purpose of the passage is to basically discuss the uh, uh, tell you about the diet what the diet are is tell you that it is debunk uh, like debunk the diet and also highlight a potential grave concern regarding the diet as such so now let us take a look at the options trace the evolution of the grapefruit diet from its origins in hollywood to its present day popularity among weight, weight loss enthusiasts he essentially does introduce when uh, what happened okay uh, in the 70s and 80s it survived but the point is not actually tracing its evolution it's not saying okay it started here then it was taken up here then it was taken up here it was taken up here most of the passage is in fact a warning against the grapefruit or consumption of grapefruit under specific cases the focus is in fact in this part where he's warning that okay there is something serious that can go wrong if you eat uh, grapefruit so the point is never the evolution of grapefruit diet at all so a is incorrect Discuss the trend of the grapefruit diet and warn the readers of the potential dangers of consuming grapefruit while taking certain medication. This captures both parts of it, telling you about the grapefruit diet and also telling you that there are there's a potential severe risk involved in consumption of grapefruit under if you are taking certain medications. So this captures both uh, main points of the uh, passage as such. So I'd say this is the right option as such. Let us also take a look at CDE. Explore the various ways in which grapefruit can interact with different medications, including its ability to increase the levels of these drugs in the body and potential consequences of this interaction. So, firstly, he does not uh, mention potential consequences of his interaction. Uh, he does not mention any other way in which a grapefruit can interact with uh, different medications. He in discusses only one way, which is that it can increase or amplify the effect of certain medications. He, do he does not discuss any other form of interaction as such. So, explore the various ways. There is no various ways. Only one way is given that is increasing the effect or amping up the effect of the medication. There are no various ways discussed. And it, this is also not the focus. The focus is to basically tell you, give you a warning that there is a potential grave consequence over here. The It is not a scientific uh, passage discussing the different drug interactions as such. That is not the focus at all. So, C can be eliminated because it is not a focus area. A and C are giving you side points, not the focus area at all. Determine the specific mechanisms by which grapefruit is able to alter the metabolism of various medications and the potential health risks associated with this interaction. This part is correct, but this part is definite, it's not even discussed in the par, uh, passage as such. You can't say this is the primary purpose because he does not discuss any mechanisms, he does not discuss how it alters the metabolism of various medications. This part is completely out of uh, scope of the passage as such. So, because of that, it is easy to eliminate option D. Argue for the use of grapefruit as a dietary aid, citing its effectiveness in promoting weight loss and its numerous health benefits. This is the opposite of what he has done in the passage. In the passage, he says that it is not a dietary aid, it is not effective in promoting weight loss and he in fact highlights a health uh, risk associated with consuming uh, grapefruit. So, opposite exactly like 180 degrees of what is given in the passage, very easy to eliminate option E. So, the right answer is option B. Now, let us take a look at the second question. The second paragraph of the passage plays with which of the following roles? Uh, so, basically, you are asked for the role of the passage. So, what do you achieve with that particular passage? Not the main point. We know that the main point is that uh, it tells you what it is not scientific, but it has survived and it con continues to cause issues today. So, that is the point. But we are not asked for the main point of the passage. We are asked for the role played by it. So, the role can be introducing a topic, furthering a discussion, uh, setting the context. So, these are roles played by the uh, this uh, providing an argument for, providing an argument against. The role of the paragraph in the passage is basically how it serves the overall point of the passage as such. So, let us take a look at the uh, uh, options. It describes the various factors that contributed to the popularity of grapefruit diet, including its en endorsement by celebrities and the hype surrounding its supposed weight loss benefits, among other things. It does not actually tell you the various factors. It just says that it survived as such. And uh, uh, endorsement of cel by celebrities is given, one celebrity is given, but essentially, uh, the uh, uh, paragraph basically says that it has somehow survived over the decades and it continues to be something that plagues nutritionists today. So, it is not the various factors of for its popularity have not been discussed, 
मोर इंपॉर्टेंटली इट्स पॉपुलरिटी और अनपॉपुलरिटी इज नॉट द मेन पॉइंट द मेन पॉइंट इज दैट दिस इज कंटिन्यूज टू बी समथिंग दैट अफेक्ट्स न्यूट्रिशनिस्ट एंड इट इज रेलिवेंट दिस ग्रेप फ्रूट डाइट इज एसेंशियली रेलिवेंट टू द पैसेज बिकॉज द ऑथर इज साउंडिंग ए कंसर्न और इशूइंग अ वार्निंग अबाउट how grapefruit can interact with certain medications to create some uh, potentially life threatening uh, consequences as such so essentially the grapefruit diet sets the stage or gives you context or why uh, the significance of what is happening next why does he have to tell you about okay why is this dangerous he has to tell you about that by telling you okay grapefruit is part of our like cultural uh, uh, like it is part of like eating uh, habits in fact there is a fad about it there are like juices uh, like juice exclusive spin off so essentially there is a uh, uh, there this that particular uh, paragraph tells you why we have to take this potential health uh, concern seriously because if that fad is there then the chances of the uh, potentially life threatening uh, consequences happening is higher if there's no fat surrounding the uh, eating of uh, grapefruit then it is unlikely that perfect storm of factors will take place but if there's a fad people are eating a lot of grapefruits even drinking uh, chugging grapefruit juice then the potentially uh, negative consequences that he may, may, uh, mentions in the third paragraph become more likely so that was the point of that particular paragraph why the role of that particular paragraph giving the significance of this warning the warning that is issued in uh, paragraph 3 can be taken seriously because of the significance of how much we actually eat grapefruit as such so let us take a look at the uh, second this it has it, uh, it misses a misses the point of why it actually was given so a is can be eliminated it demonstrates that the grapefruit diet has a long history of being popularized as a weight loss aid with numerous celebrities and industry groups promoting its supposed benefits this is true this is true that numerous celebrities and industry groups promoted it and how it was popularized as a weight loss aid completely true but the role it played was essentially putting the, like giving the significance of why the warning was issued that part is not given this is the point of it okay one of part point of the main point of the paragraph if they ask you okay what is the main point of the paragraph this would be a fairly good summary of the paragraph as such but the role it plays is essentially setting like uh, giving the significance of the third paragraph which is missing over here so we can eliminate option b it contrasts the views of proponents of the grapefruit diet who tout its effectiveness as a weight loss aid with the view of critics who argue that it is a baseless fad it doesn't really contrast the views it basically mentions and it is not saying that okay a say these b say this the author says that this is uh, this is uh, like he debunks it completely so it's not that he is contrasting saying okay for uh, that these voices are uh, these voices are for these voices are against he basically mentions that certain celebrities endorse it it has the endorsement of the citrus industry but it is a uh, useless fad ineffective fad as such so c is also not correct it sets the stage for the discussion on the potential risk of consuming grapefruit by highlighting the misconception about the effectiveness of the grapefruit diet this is exactly the uh, reason why it was given because because of it you understand why uh, the grapefruit diet is especially uh, a cause for concern because there is this grave concern about uh, uh, overdosing on certain medications after eating grapefruit and if the grapefruit diet happens that the risk that that perfect storm will occur increases as such so this is the reason why that second paragraph was put so this actually captures the role of the second paragraph now let's take a look at the last uh, option as well it discusses the various spin off versions of the grapefruit diet that have emerged over the years including a dangerous juice exclusive version called the grapefruit tart this is a fact given in that paragraph but that is not even the main point of the paragraph it is basically one of the facts mentioned in the paragraph as such so e also completely misses the reason why it was included only d captures the reason why that paragraph was included so d is the right answer the passage provides information to answer which of the following questions uh, what were all the different spin offs of the grapefruit diet that made the appearance during its revival only one spin off is given so we don't know what are the different spin offs that are there uh, yet the diet survived spawning a revival a dangerous uh, uh, juice exclusive spin off grapefruit so we got one spin off but we don't know what all the different spin offs were so we can't answer this particular question how effective is the grapefruit diet compared to other fad diets of the century we know that it is ineffective but compared to other fad diets we don't know the other fad diets are not mentioned at all as such so b is also incorrect 
what chemical pathways are responsible for the complications originating from grapefruit consumption the chemical pathways are not mentioned we do not have any scientific discussion about the chemical pathways so c is also incorrect why do the chemical properties of grapefruit lead to medical complications this is not given in the passage and it is also given that they don't people don't really know how it actually uh, works or understand the fruit well so d definitely cannot be answered what are the potential dangers of consuming grapefruit while taking certain medications? The danger is of overdosing. That is the basic danger. It amplifies the effect of certain medications. So, you are more prone to overdosing. So, that is the potential danger. So, only E can be answered. So, the right answer is option E. It can be inferred from the passage that most pharmacologists would most likely describe the consumption of grapefruits as by people as. So, pharm the one in background in pharmacology is given as a critic of the uh, uh, critic of uh, uh, eating grapefruit and somebody who would warn you of its dangers. So, basically somebody who would say that there is certain risk involved with eating grapefruit. Again, the author basically says that for most people it is completely safe but under certain conditions it can be potentially uh, life threatening. So, he is saying that okay under most conditions it is perfectly safe but if certain conditions meet if the perfect storm of conditions occurs then it could be potentially life threatening. So, it is not risky in you by as itself it is not that okay you eat a grapefruit you will die but under certain conditions it can be life threatening. So, let us take a look at the options completely safe no there is a risk involved utterly unsafe at absolutely not it is safe in most cases but except for certain cases where it is life threatening risky if under medication this actually captures it if it is if you are under certain medication this could be potentially life threatening so this actually captures what their stand would be that there are risks involved they would uh, the pharmacologist would be uh, uh, be a, issuing a warning of its po probable dangers so c is the right uh, this that okay there is probable cause for caution over here not that you should throw away the grapefruit but you should be mindful of when you eat the grapefruit and especially if you are taking medication as such potentially harmful in most conditions in most conditions it is not harmful so d is also incorrect precarious given insu insufficient information on the effects again not precarious it is given that it is perfectly normal under for most people it is completely safe under most uh, conditions as such so d and e uh, uh, disproportionately state the risk of eating a grapefruit the risk is only under very small set of conditions uh, for a small set of cases it is not a widespread risk as such so d and e also can be eliminated only c is the right answer When the author says that the grapefruit diet like pretty much all the other fat diets is mostly bunk uh, until the, so basically this one is uh, mostly bunk if people are losing weight at the regimen that is because the citrus was being recommended as part of a portion control low calorie carbohydrate diet not because it had any flab lasting powers. So, he is saying that the grapefruit diet does not work. If you lost weight using uh, the grapefruit diet it was because it, you were part of a calorie control diet portion control low calorie low carbohydrate diet and because of that you actually lost weight not because of the grapefruit the grapefruit did nothing as such so that is the point being made by those lines so let us uh, when he states that what is he saying he is saying that the grapefruit is ineffective it was the other things that were part of your diet restrictions that essentially produced the uh, this as such assumes that any weight loss that may have occurred while following the diet was not due to the grapefruit but due to other factors such as calorie and carbohydrate restriction exactly the case he is saying that that is the case that is why he is writing that that uh, the weight loss that occurred was not because of the grapefruit the grapefruit had no effect uh, but the other factors involved in that diet had an effect and that is why you had a weight loss criticizes the grapefruit diet as being a fat diet that is not based on sound scientific evidence and further asserts that it is likely to be ineffective he is not saying that it is likely to be ineffective he is saying that if it is effective it is part because of the other restrictions that you are following not because of the uh, grapefruit as such so it misses the key component that it is if you find it effective it is because uh, it is not the cause of the if, uh, effect as such the other restrictions are the cause of the weight loss as such so b misses that part so we can eliminate option b acknowledges that the grapefruit diet has been popular for many years and has survived through the decades but does not have a scientific prim uh, premise so it is not uh, really uh, saying that it is popular these lines are not really saying that is uh, uh, he does not acknowledge the popularity do, through those lines so he also can be eliminated 
D outlines the composition of the grapefruit diet to underline how its effectiveness has been overstated to boost its popularity. He does not outline the composition. I do not know exactly what the gra grapefruit diet is. After reading the passage, I do not know how exactly you are supposed to follow the diet, what its composition is. We do not know actually. So, this is definitely not the answer. Underscores the potentially harmful and life threatening implications of following the grapefruit diet that is not based on sound scientific evidence. This does not give the risk part. This, that risk part of potentially life threatening and harmful is in the later paragraphs. So, this in that, that particular part he does not underscore that point. So, E also can be eliminated. Only A tells you exactly what he is doing through that particular uh, line as such. So, A is the right option. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT points video series. I am Saili Kale. In this particular sentence correction question, we have a question which tests our knowledge of how to frame not only but also kind of uh, sentences and also uh, which are the uh, correct pronouns to use. So, let us take a look at the sentence. The success of the Roman Empire was not only due to the strength and training of their soldiers but also since it had a well organized system of communication and supply that allowed for effective coordination of its widespread armies and ensured they had the necessary resources to carry out their orders. See firstly whenever you notice not only to be there you have to remember that whatever is just after not only but also should have the exact same structure. So, if you have not only due to the strength, you should also have but also due to something as such. So, the this starting of this uh, underlined part should always start with due just to ensure there is parallel uh, construction for not only and but also part. So, whenever you have not only A but also B, A and B should have exact parallel structure as such. It should start in the same way, it should have the same uh, format as such. So, therefore, our correct uh, option should definitely start with due. So, since and because can be eliminated, this can also be eliminated. We are left with C and E. Now, one more thing that you will uh, notice in the original sentence also, when you are reading it, you will notice it immediately is that the pronouns are being changed quite a bit. Here it is there, their soldiers, then you have it over here, there you have it over here again. So, it is there, it, it as such. Firstly, uh, whether it is it or there, it has to be consistently used throughout the sentence. In this particular case, whether you use its or theirs depends on how uh, you view the uh, uh, sentence as such. If you view uh, the Roman Empire as a singular unit and you are describing everything about a singular unit as such, then you will have to use it. If you are uh, considering Roman Empire as a group of people, as a population, as a uh, different groups of people coming together, not as one unit but as a group of people, then you have to use there as such. In this particular sentence, when, since we are describing uh, the ability, uh, the strength and tra training of the soldiers, the system of communications, we are essentially uh, describing things which have uh, different owners of different parts or uh, groups as such. Again, uh, in most cases, uh, it and there can be used interchangeably. It is mostly a question of what you are more comfortable with. But in this case, since there has already been used once, you cannot then switch back to it. Uh, if you use it, you have to use it throughout. If you use there, you have to use there throughout. In this case, given the fact that we are uh, looking at uh, the Roman Empire as a group of people who own different things, uh, the same uh, person is not owning the system of communication and the soldiers and the coordination etc. Since we are looking at it as a group of people, there would be more appropriate. But even if you consider it a single unit and want it to be it, since this is there is over there in the non-underlined part, you cannot use it in the underlined part. So, because of that, it is uh, the correct uh, option to choose would be option C. That would be consistent with the pronoun that has been used earlier. And you uh, consistency is more important than your personal it versus their choice. So, the correct option is option C. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT points video series. I am Saili Kale. In this particular sentence correction question, we have a sentence correction question with a lot of things going on. But there are uh, specific things which are referring to but versus however, when, when to use which, uh, the right placement of a modifier. Uh, and also uh, the pronoun choice between they and it as such. So, let us take a look at the sentence. On the ocean surface, nutrient pollution can cause algal booms, blooms and harm marine life. But in deeper levels, when controlled properly, they can also support the rapid growth of phytoplankton, which is a crucial part of its ocean's food chain. Now, before even I look at the options, it is very clear to me that there is something wrong with the underlying sentence. What is wrong with the underlying sentence? 
here when you read it it sounds as if you are controlling the deeper levels because this modifier is incorrectly placed after deeper levels so firstly first things first you have to change the position of the modifier we have to bring it up first before deeper levels as such secondly the use of in deeper levels is incorrect you should say at deeper levels or at deeper depths the use of in uh, uh, is incorrect the third thing that i notice is nutrient pollution is a singular noun it is something which is a a uh, form of pollution air pollution is affecting my health water pollution is affecting me all forms of pollution are singular nouns as such it's not a collection or a group of people or it's not a collection as such because it is a singular unit it is a singular noun the use of they is incorrect it should be replaced with it now with these things uh, in mind let us take a look at the options but in deeper levels when controlled properly they firstly misplace modifier and the use of they is incorrect there are many things wrong with this so we can eliminate this let's take a look at the second option but when controlled properly at deeper depths it so it is uh, uh, corrected all the errors that we have uh, found at deeper depths when controlled properly that is there at the front when deeper uh, controlled properly at deeper depths it can also support so this is having no errors as such let's take a look at options c d and e also c starts with however now when it comes to but and however you have to remember that but can be used in the middle of a sentence you can start a sentence comma and put but and continue with a uh, contrary part to the sentence but for however you have to start the sentence with however you can start a sentence with however or you can start the sentence after a semicolon and then put however but you can't put however at the after a comma as such uh, essentially when you are introducing a contradiction as such you are in, uh, introducing something uh, which contradicts the first clause that you have put you can put a semicolon and start with however or you can start a separate sentence with however you can't put it in the middle with however you can use however in the middle of the sentence but not to introduce a contrasting clause you can't introduce a contrasting clause in the middle of the sentence with however you can if you are want to do that you will have to use a semicolon and not uh, however as such so again uh, because of that we can eliminate this another reason is that the use of pronoun this and they is incorrect it is it you have to use it to refer to the uh, nutrient pollution so using that also i can eliminate c and e but controlling this at deeper depths and it is completely missing the pronoun which is needed as such uh, if you remove the pronoun uh, it will become can also support uh, this uh, pronoun missing itself is incorrect but even uh, another error is the form of uh, uh, the use of the continuous form of uh, control see the rest of the sentence is in simple present tense uh, you are basically saying that okay if uh, it can cause algal uh, blooms but it can also uh, help for the rat rapid growth of phytoplankton so when because this is something which is an ongoing process which happens all the time the simple present tense is used but for the later part of the sentence we are essentially saying for this to occur the rapid growth of phytoplankton there should be proper control of uh, at deeper depths so the control part should precede the uh, rapid growth part so because it is something that comes before in time we have to essentially take a step back in time when it comes to the uh, uh, tense of the verb so instead of using control we have to use controlled to in indicate that this has to happen before the rapid growth of phytoplankton takes place so the right form of verb to use is also controlled and not controlling or simple control also will not do but when controlled uh, is the only uh, correct way or the correct tense format for the particular part of the sentence so option b is the correct option hi friends welcome to gmat points video series uh, in this particular sentence we are looking at a sentence where there is redundancy involved in the use of noun and uh, in that case we uh, the correct use of uh, noun versus pronoun is the uh, matter at hand so let's take a look at the uh, sentence under the new city ordinances when a property owner is charged for uh, damages to a public space wholly or largely as a result of actions by a tenant the property owner is entitled to recoup the amount of the damages so if i see the options okay firstly if i read the sentence out aloud the first thing that i notice is that 
property owner is already given over here and there is no confusion about who is entitled to recoup the uh, amount of charges. It's not that the tenant will uh, recoup the amount of charges because uh, essentially uh, when he is charged for the damages, he is going to get the, uh, he is going to recoup the uh, amount of damages as such. So, in, under the, this when a property owner is charged for as a result of actions, you can essentially replace it by a pronoun over here. The repetition, the property owner is not needed in this case. It is unnecessary repetition of the uh, noun, uh, the property owner. And because of that, the underlying part is incorrect. So, because of that, I can remove this. We should use a pronoun, either the gender neutral they, uh, they are entitled to recoup or he or she is entitled to recoup, both are fine as such. I also see a difference between the options where it is some end with recoup and some end with recoup for. So, which of these two is right, recoup or recoup for? See, whenever you see recoup the amount, recoup the amount is correct, recoup for the amount is incorrect. The use of for is not, uh, it is not, not only needed, it is grammatically incorrect. You do not recoup for, recoup basically is a verb which indicates, uh, which takes the object, the amount and therefore the use of preposition for is incorrect. So, because of that I can eliminate options B and D, the uh, for does not uh, succeed the word recoup as such. So, now he, you have option C and he, he is entitled to recoup, he or she is entitled to recoup. Now, we can't assume that the property owner is necessarily male. So, the correct form to use is he or she is entitled to recoup. So, the correct answer is option E. Hi friends, uh, welcome to GMAT points video series, I am Saili Kali. In this particular sentence correction question, we have a comparison of plays of Shakespeare to those of other playwrights. So, let us take a look at the sentence. Despite the fact that Shakespeare's plays were less well known than Marlowe's is and not as groundbreaking as kids is, they are still considered to be of great significance. See, firstly what I notice is that Shakespeare's plays are being compared to those of Marlowe's and uh, kids. So, here instead of is and over here, you should have are or were because essentially you are comparing plural to plural. You are not comparing uh, the plays of Shakespeare to a singular work of Marlowe. You are comparing it to his plays. So, plays are plural. So, you should say Marlowe's are or Marlowe's were and not, not as groundbreaking as kids uh, are or were. Since this is were, this should be were and this can be are as such. They are still considered to be a great significance is fine. But essentially it should not be is firstly. Another thing is that we have to compare plays with plays. We can't compare plays with playwrights. So, you have to compare Shakespeare's plays with Marlowe's and with kids as such. So, let us take a look at the options. Less well known than Marlowe's is and now not as groundbreaking as kids is. This is incorrect because uh, they should be uh, replaced with were and uh, are as such. At least are or were. Not as well known as Marlowe. You can't compare the playwright uh, plays to a playwright. You have to compare like the plays have to be compared to either Marlowe's, just write, even if you write just Marlowe's, okay, that indicates that you are referencing his work or his plays as such. But you can't just compare it to Marlowe as such. So, this is incorrect. Uh, comparing plays to Marlowe is incorrect, but comparing plays to Marlowe's plays or you just write Marlowe's, even that is fine. So, not as well, well known as Marlowe and not as groundbreaking as Kid is incorrect. So, this is incorrect. Uh, not less well known than Marlowe's and not as groundbreaking as kids, it. Here, this part is fine, this part is fine, but the use of it is incorrect. We see a split between it and they in the last part. Okay, if you see it is they over here, they over here and uh, B, C and E use it. You are referring to what exactly? If you remove the uh, comparison, you are referring to Shakespeare's plays. They, they are still of great significance. Now, since plays are a plural noun, this part should be they. It cannot be it. It cannot be it because it is not a singular noun. Plays are a plural noun. So, you have to use the plural uh, pronoun which is they. You cannot use the singular pronoun which is it. So, it is a clearly incorrect. So, this, this, this. So, B, uh, C and E can be easily eliminated because they use, it uses the pronoun it. The only option that we have left is D. Not as well known as Marlowe's and not as groundbreaking as kids. They. So, everything is corrected. We have the right possessive form Marlowe's indicating that you are comparing place to place and the right uh, pronoun being used they. So, the there is no error in the sentence as such. So, the correct option is option D. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT points video series. I am Saili Kale. 
In this particular video, we will be taking a look at a sentence correction question. So, let us take a look at the sentence. Regarded as a pioneering ast uh, astronomer, Galileo Galilei's contributions to science were perhaps more groundbreaking than those of almost any other astronomers of his time. Now, if you take a look at the options, okay, you are uh, comparing the options, you see a split that than those of almost any other, than almost any other, compared to almost any other, than almost any, compared to almost any. So, there is a split between than versus compared and there is a split of any other versus any. But most of all, if you see option A, the most important thing is there in option A is that those is mentioned in option A. And whether you should use the pronoun those or nothing should or like blank, no absence of pronoun. So, if you consider should we, do we need a pronoun or do we not need a pronoun like those. See, in this case, those essentially refers to the contributions of other astronomers. When you are comparing contributions of Galileo Galilei, you have to compare them with the contributions of other astronomers and not the astronomers themselves. So, between these two choices, this is the important choice to make. You need that pronoun to indicate that you are comparing contributions to contributions. So, because those is given in option A, only option A is right because it contains the pronoun indicating that the comparison is being made between contributions and not you are not comparing the contributions of Galilee with uh, the uh, contributions of his uh, with the uh, astro other astronomers you are comparing them to the contributions to contributions as such. So, option A is the only one which is grammatically correct the remaining sentences which skip this particular pronoun are incorrect. Hi friends welcome to GMAT points video series. In this particular critical reasoning question, we are given a par paragraph about how uh, natural disasters are probably caused by climate change and to actually address the increasing number of disasters, we need to actually address climate change. So, let us take a look at the paragraph. The number of people affected by natural disasters such as hurricanes, earthquakes and floods has been increasing in recent years. According to data from the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, the number of people affected by natural disasters has increased significantly over the past two decades, with over 1.3 billion people affected in the year 2018 alone. One contributing factor to this trend is climate change, which is causing an increase in the severity and frequency of natural disasters. Given the increasing number of people affected by natural disasters, it is important for governments and individuals to take action to address climate change and reduce the risk of future natural disasters. So, they are basically saying that uh, more and more people are being affected by natural disasters and why is this occurring? Why are more people being affected by natural disasters? Because climate change is a factor in causing more natural disasters and that is why we are uh, having, uh, we are uh, like people are experiencing so many natural disasters as such. If you want to prevent uh, natural disasters or being people being affected by it, we have to take steps to address climate change as such. So, essentially a link has been created. The Premise is, this is the premise that, uh, okay, the this is basically a lot of people are being affected by uh, natural disasters and this is basically uh, being indirectly caused by climate change as such. And the course of action is that given how climate change is affecting us, we need to address it as. So, basically climate change is essentially being indirectly the uh, identified as the cause for the natural disasters and the course of action is being uh, suggested that we need to actually address climate change to uh, prevent natural disasters. Identified as the cause, evidence is given at the first of it that this is one contributing factor is the this and we a uh, course of action is identified that we have to address climate change. So, now that we understand what the author's argument is that what is his premise, what uh, this part is the premise, this part is the, the conclusion that uh, climate change is behind the, all of this and the fact that it uh, because so many people are being affected, we have to do something to address the issue. So, now that we understand what the uh, conclusion the author has reached and what course of action he is suggesting. Let us take a look at the question, which of the following if true would strengthen the above argument. So, we need essentially we have to strengthen the argument that climate change is responsible for the particular this because that is essentially the conclusion. The course of action is secondary. The primary argument is that climate change is the reason why we are experiencing more natural disasters and anyway evidence that kind of backs that up would be uh, something that strengthens the above argument.
So let us take a look at the options. A study published in the journal Environmental Research Letters found that the media coverage and public awareness of natural disasters has increased over the past years. Now, if this is true, would it strengthen the original argument? No, because we have to essentially establish the causation link between climate change and natural disasters to actually strengthen the argument. The fact that people are more aware does not explain why climate change has been identified as the reason behind the uh, increase in natural disasters. Our conclusion is about the link between climate change and natural disasters and media awareness has nothing to do with either of them as such. So, A is completely irrelevant to our conclusion as such. Consider option B. Multiple reports over the past decade have shown that climate change is leading to an increase in the intensity and frequency of extreme weather events. Now, this is a specific evidence that basically supports if there are increase in intensity and fre uh, frequency of extreme weather uh, events, basically that means that there will be more hurricanes, there will be more uh, storms, there will be more extreme weather events which affect us, which cause natural disasters. So, if you have a hurricane, then there is natural disaster in terms of loss of life and property. If you have an intense storm, then again there is a loss of life or loss of property. So, if there is, this gives evidence to link the natural disasters, put the missing link that uh, climate change causes extreme weather events which essentially lead to natural disasters. So, because it is strengthening the link between climate change and natural disasters, it is evidence which is supporting the central claim of the passage. Therefore, this I would say is the right answer. Let's take a look at option C, D and E as well. A report from United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction in 2020 found that the number of people affected by natural disasters has been relatively constant over the past two decades. Now, if this is actually true, it actually refutes our main point. Our main point is that because of climate change, the number of people affected is increasing. It has been increasing because uh, climate change is a factor and because as climate change becomes worse, as its impact becomes worse, the number of natural disasters increase and because the number of natural disasters increase, the number of people affected also increase. Now, if option C is actually true, it actually says that, okay, uh, the number of people affected is constant, which means that it is not actually climate change because climate change has been the factor. Uh, it can't be climate change because if it was climate change, then uh, impact should have been an increasing trend as such. It would not have been constant death. So, option C actually breaks or gives evidence against the link that is the main conclusion of the paragraph. So, C actually weakens the conclusion. So, we can eliminate option C. The increasing number of people affected by natural disasters can be at attributed to a lack of preparedness and inadequate uh, response uh, uh, efforts by uh, governments and individuals. Even if this is true, okay, even if this is true that, okay, if uh, there was better response or better uh, efforts by governments and individuals, it does not in, uh, indicate why those uh, extreme uh, uh, natural disasters took place in the first place as such. Again, it does not uh, essentially add value or add strength to the main argument. You can then, in fact, uh, this is counters the argument by saying that the number of people affected is not because that the disasters have become more severe or more frequent, it's just that our response has become worse. So, this in fact, if it does anything, it is actually weakening the argument. So, option D is incorrect. Government and individuals have not taken any action to address climate change or reduce the risk of future natural disasters. Now, whether they have done anything to uh, affect climate change or not is secondary. Our main contention is that there is a link between climate change and the number of uh, natural disasters. And whether you have taken any effort to address climate change or not does not either strengthen or weaken the uh, causal link as such. So, option E does nothing to either strengthen or weaken the argument. So, option E also can be eliminated. The correct option is option B. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT Points video series. I am Saili Kale. In this particular uh, critical reasoning question, we have to identify the assumption behind the conclusion in the uh, paragraph as such. Many people are struggling to afford the cost of housing in urban areas. A study by the Urban Institute found that in the United States, approximately 50% of the renters in urban areas are considered cost burden, meaning they spend more than 30% of their income on housing. One potential solution to this problem is to increase the supply of affordable housing in urban areas. So basically, a course of action is given over here. A conclusion is reached that is uh, people are struggling to afford the cost of housing and a solution for that is given. Why are, uh, what is the evidence to provided to show that okay people are struggling to pay for housing? Uh, this is the evidence. So this part is the premise or the facts. This is the conclusion as such. And this is a course of action that is mentioned over here. 
the fact is that most people are cost burdened that is uh, the cost of rent is more than 30% of their income therefore many people are struggling to find uh, uh, afford the cost of housing because it is a large part of their income as such the solution to this is to build more affordable housing so a uh, premise is given then a conclusion is reached and a course of action is mentioned now to actually find out the assumption uh, based on the above argument which of the following would be a valid assumption so to basically find out the assumption we have to look at this particular link the fact that people more than uh, 50 percent of the renters in urban areas are cost burden now using that we have to figure out the assumption being made that is people are struggling to afford the cost of housing in urban areas so this uh, from this part to this part the conclusion there will be uh, several assumptions that are being made and we have to find out which is the assumption being made to reach from this point to this point the way i actually find out the valid assumption is by using the method of invalidating it now if you invalidate a uh, assumption what happens is that if you invalidate the assumption then the conclusion is also invalidated the conclusion and the course of action become no longer necessary so if your assumption is not true your conclusion is not true and your course of action is also completely unnecessary therefore it would mean that if any any of these options basically uh, if you negate that option it basically negates the uh, conclusion and negates the course of action there it makes it completely unnecessary or not uh, uh, logical at all then that is an assumption that has been made in the reasoning the minute you invalidate your assumption the foundation of your conclusion crumbles which makes everything which is built on that foundation completely sound unsound and that is basically how you identify an assumption so let us take a look at the options given increasing the supply of affordable housing will result in an increase in demand for the housing in urban areas now in this particular case suppose you invalidate it that increase of supply will uh, not result in an increase in demand. Suppose the supply increases and the demand remains same in urban areas. Now, if the supply increases, demand remains same, then the cost of housing will go down, which is what you actually want. You want the cost of housing to go down such that people are able to afford the housing as such. So, if the assumption is not true, your course of action and conclusion would actually be uh, uh, would be still logical because they would actually achieve the objective that they were trying to do which is make the uh, uh, housing affordable increasing the supp uh, supply of affordable housing would actually achieve the objectives that were set out in the paragraph as such which means that this is not only uh, this if you invalidate it it does not invalidate the conclusion or the course of action in any way so option a can be eliminated it is desirable for people to be uh, able to afford housing in urban areas. Now, suppose you invalidate this uh, assumption that you don't care whether people are able to afford housing in urban areas or rather you don't want them to actually stay a lot in urban areas. You want those who can't afford uh, houses in urban areas to actually move away from the urban areas. Suppose you have dense urban areas and you don't want them to be too dense and you want those who can't afford uh, living in urban areas to essentially spread out away from the urban areas to reduce the density of population as such. Those two could be the reasons why you don't want uh, like uh, affordable housing in urban areas or you don't want people to be easily be able to afford housing in urban areas. Now, if this is the case, what happens to your logic? My conclusion that okay people are struggling to afford housing so I should build affordable housing that course of action completely crumbles because if I don't want them to stay in urban areas if I don't want them to uh, if I don't care whether they can afford housing in urban areas I'm not going to build affordable housing so if option B is invalidated the entire course of action seems completely illogical if I don't want them to stay in urban areas then I will not build affordable housing in urban areas I'll actually incentivize them to move out or if I don't care at all whether they live here or they live in any other area if I don't care at all again I won't go all the way and build affordable housing because I don't care whether they live in urban areas or not whether they can afford houses in urban areas or not so both uh, if option B is invalidated then in both cases the course of action makes no sense anymore so that basically means that B is an assumption that is being made in the passage as such so now that we understand this let us do the same thing for options C, D and E and let us see whether uh, they invalidate the con uh, conclusion or course of action the cost of housing in urban areas is solely dependent on the demand for housing now suppose you invalidate this that it is not solely dependent on demand for housing it is also dependent on the supply for housing 
this actually supports your particular theory that if you build more affordable housing if you increase the supply the cost of housing will go down and not only will it go down for the housing that you have built it will go down for everybody else so in essentially it will help you achieve the objective that you wanted so if you invalidate this conclusion your objective is actually still standing your objective still makes sense so option c is incorrect Renters in urban areas are more likely to be considered cost burden than homeowners. If that is the case, if suppose I invalidate this assumption that homeowners are more cost burden than renters as such. Homeowners have a bigger, uh, uh, have uh, like have more uh, percentage of their income going towards housing as compared to renters. Now, even if that is the case, even then if I build affordable housing, people can buy that affordable housing. So, it will be helpful even to homeowners, not just renters as such. So, even in that case, it makes sense for me to build affordable housing. So, since it still makes sense for me to build affordable housing, even though this option is inv invalidated, if this statement is invalidated, that would mean option D is not a valid assumption. The cost of housing in urban areas has been increasing in recent years, making it difficult for people to afford housing. Now, let me invalidate this assumption. Suppose that the cost of housing in urban areas has remained stagnant. So, it has not really increased. But suppose wages have gone down. If wages have gone down, housing cost as a per percentage of wages has gone up, which means that they will still be cost burdened. The trend of being cost burdened has been on the rise. It would still make sense for me to actually build affordable housing in that particular case. So even if I invalidate option E, my course of action and my conclusion are not invalidated. So the correct answer is option B. Only that makes it uh, completely unnecessary for me to actually go and build affordable housing. So option B is the right answer. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT points video series. In this particular uh, critical reasoning question, we have a uh, paragraph which is about healthy foods and unhealthy foods and the choice and accessibility to both of them. So consider the uh, paragraph. According to the data from World Health Organization, approximately 13% of the global population is obese and obesity is a major contributor to a range of health problems including diabetes, heart disease and certain cancers. One of the primary factors contributing to obesity is the increasing availability and consumption of unhealthy processed uh, foods. Given the high prevalence of obesity and evidence linking the availability of unhealthy foods to obesity, it may be important to consider strategies for reducing the availability and consumption of unhealthy processed foods in order to address the obesity pandemic and improve public health. This could include initiatives to regulate the marketing and sales of unhealthy foods, increase the availability of healthier options and educate the public about the importance of a healthy diet. So what is the premise over here? The premise is that there is a link between eating unhealthy foods and uh, obesity and if you have increasing availability and increasing, uh, if your diet is increasingly composed of unhealthy foods, then you are more likely to develop obesity and all the other diseases that go with it. So this is the information that is given. Now based on this information, what has the author concluded? Given the link between obesity and unhealthy foods, what we should try to do is we should limit how much uh, unhealthy food people tend to eat and therefore we have to basically find a way to reduce the consumption of unhealthy food and increase the consumption of healthy food. So they arrive at this con conclusion that we have to try to reduce the consumption of unhealthy food and part of it is basically availability. Uh, if you reduce accessibility to it, it will reduce this to and to we will reduce the, uh, we are trying to target uh, the redu uh, reduction in consumption of unhealthy food to address obesity. So from the premise you have the conclusion that you reduce obesity by reducing the uh, consumption of unhealthy food. And then a lot of, uh, then a uh, course of action is given. The course of action is basically to make unhealthy foods less uh, available, uh, regulate the sales of unhealthy food, make it uh, make healthier foods more available, educate the public, etc., etc. So essentially, you want to reduce the availability. The course of action is reduce availability of unhealthy food and increase the availability of um, uh, healthy food and basically educate people that you know what healthier food is better for you. So this is the course of action as such. Why do you want people to switch from unhealthy food to healthy food? We want them to switch because there's uh, the unhealthy food is linked to obesity and there's an obesity uh, epidemic going on. So to stop the obesity epidemic, 
you want to reduce the consumption of uh, unhealthy food to reduce the consumption of unhealthy food you identify that i'll make it less easily available i'll make it uh, i'll regulate how it is marketed and sold i'll increase the availability of healthy food and by doing all of this together i'll uh, like educate the people and by doing all of this together i'm going to reduce the consumption of unhealthy food so now that we understand the premise the conclusion and the course of action let us try to see what the question is what which of the following if true would weaken the above claim now what would weaken the above claim and any evidence which kind of breaks this logic that uh, obesity is linked to uh, the uh, uh, obesity is linked to consumption of unhealthy foods or uh, the, if that link is weakened then we will be able to actually weaken the above claim the other way uh, to uh, weaken the above claim would be basically to refute this logic that doing this would help us achieve the given conclusion if the uh, course of action would be ineffective that also would actually help us uh, uh, refute the uh, course of action and the argument that is uh, the claim that is made above in this particular case basically uh, the uh, op option that weakens the uh, like the claim or any conclusion the most or any course of action the most is if you invalidate any assumption that is made if any of the options invalidates assumption then the whole foundation of the claim and the conclusion are shook and once that foundation is shook it weakens that particular claim the most so if any of the options invalidates any of the assumptions being made then it would have the most impact on the uh, on weakening the above argument so let's take a look at the options many people who are obese do not consume unhealthy processed foods now even if this is true even if this is true that many people do not consume we do not know whether this many represents the vast majority as such so even if like say 20% do not consume unhealthy processed food if the remaining 80% of the obese population do consume unhealthy processed food and their obesity is linked to that uh, processed food then it is uh, then your conclusion your course of action still makes sense so if even if this is true it doesn't weaken the claim that you should try to limit the access to the uh, unhealthy food to uh, address the uh, obesity epidemic so just from many it doesn't uh, make it isn't uh, a strong enough claim so option a is not the correct answer healthier options are often perceived to be less tasty than unhealthy processed food making it difficult for people to make healthier choices now essentially even if this is true what is the case in this case basically what you're saying that people are choosing unhealthy foods because not because they are more available because they actually like the taste of it now this does slightly weaken your claim because it means that even if you reduce the uh, level of availability of unhealthy food versus the uh, availability of healthy food even then people might still end up choosing the unhealthy food as such but even in this case if you make it less available less uh, marketed towards the consumer it is going to impact sales even if people like the taste of a over b if uh, getting a is difficult if the marketing of a is weaker if b is more readily available even then even if you have a taste preference and uh, if you educate the people you that you know what even though this is tasty it's not good for you even then it might people might make the choice to actually eat healthy food so even if b is true given the course of action the course of action would still have an impact in reducing the obesity pandemic so b would also uh, not be uh, enough to weaken the claim claim because it weakens it only slightly as such many people who are obese have other underlying health conditions that contribute to their obesity such as hormonal imbalances and metabolic disorders again whenever you say many people it does not mean that the majority have other reasons for being obese and even if they have other underlying health concerns you still uh, can make healthier choices and if you make healthier choices even with those underlying conditions you would still be healthier than when you made unhealthy choices so even if it is that you have other factors that are contributing still in that case also making healthier choices would have an impact so even in that particular case even with option c the information in option c we would still say that our course of action would still be effective in reaching our uh, objective of reducing the uh, obesity pandemic so option c is still uh, incorrect increasing the availability of healthier options does not necessarily lead to a decrease in consumption of unhealthy processed food even if this is true 
but our uh, passage is saying not just increasing the availability but at the same time increasing healthier options and decreasing the availability of uh, unhealthier options so if you do both of them together it would mean that there will be a decrease in the consumption not just a alone but a uh, accompanied by b if you increase availability of healthier options and decrease the availability of unhealthier options then the consumption has to reduce because it is you're just making it difficult to get to unhealthy options as such so d alone just uh, increasing the availability d alone does not actually uh, weaken the claim because d alone is not being suggested over here our course of action is multi uh, has three different parts increasing the availability of healthier food decreasing the availability of unhealthy food changing how it is marketed and sold and also educating the public so it is not just increasing the availability alone that is being suggested so just saying this does not actually invalidate our claim so option d can also be eliminated Healthy food is significantly more expensive than unhealthy food and is unaffordable to the poorer section of the population which has the highest rates of obesity. Now, if this is the case, what happens? Our course of action no longer makes sense because even if people, you tell people, okay, uh, healthy food is healthier for you, unhealthy food is bad for you, increase the availability of healthier food, decrease the availability of healthier food, you are just going to make it difficult for poorer people to eat because they just can't afford the healthy food. You have made an assumption when you, you made that course of action, you made the assumption that both those foods were equally expensive. You made the assumption that if I give uh, more, uh, if I put more healthy food in front of you and less unhealthy food in front of you, you will be able to buy the healthy food. But that is an assumption you have made which E tells you that assumption is not valid. If uh, people, poor people who have the highest rates of obesity cannot buy the healthy food, then they are going to, even if you make unhealthy food un inaccessible, you are still going to end up buying the in, uh, unhealthy food as such. Which means that your entire course of action no longer makes sense. Because those two are not at the same price points, they are not uh, interchangeable. If they are not interchangeable, reducing the un uh, availability of unhealthy food and increasing the availability of healthy food is going to have no impact. Which means that E is the only option which gives thus the most to weaken the claim that is given above. It indicates that your course of action is not sufficient. You have to subsidize healthy food or penalize the unhealthy food uh, at the same time so that people are more incentivized to buy healthy food and replace unhealthy food with healthy food as such. So only E does the most to weaken the argument that is given. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT points video series. In this particular uh, critical reasoning question, we are asked to find out what uh, role the boldface portion plays in the argument. I have underlined the portion because uh, it is not seen in bold over here. So we have to find out what does the underlined portion, what role does the underlined portion play in the entire paragraph. So let us take a look at the paragraph. Many species of animals are facing a significant threat to their survival due to human activity, habitat loss and other factors. Uh, it is important to take steps to protect and preserve these endangered species in order to prevent their extinction and maintain the balance of the ecosystem. This can include efforts to conserve their habitats, regulate human activities that may be harmful to the species and implement breeding and reforestation programs. There are currently over 1000 species of animals that are classified as critically endangered by the World Wildlife Fund, which means they have a very high risk of extinction in the wild. In addition, many more species are classified as endangered or vulnerable, indicating they also face a high risk of extinction. So, in this case, what is the conclusion or main argument that the author is making? That we need to do something, otherwise animal species are going to go extinct. The species are, many species are facing a significant threat due to human activity and we need to take steps to protect them. So, the main argument or the main conclusion is that it is important to take steps to preserve them. So, we, many species are facing a significant threat to survival and it is important for us to take uh, uh, steps to preserve these, uh, this to prevent their extinction. So, this is the main conclusion as such. Now, let us take a look at the remaining and maintain the balance of the e ecosystem. Now, how would you do this? So, the first two lines as such, this first two lines are the main conclusion. Now, how do you actually achieve that uh, objective? The conclusion is that uh, many species might go extinct and we have to do something to protect and preserve them. So, these efforts can include uh, conserving their habitat, uh, regulating human activity, implementing breeding and reforestation programs. So, this is the course of action that is mentioned. How do we achieve? Uh, so, you have identified a problem in the conclusion. This is the course of action or solution to that problem. 
these two are essentially adding weight to the argument that we have that uh, many species are facing a significant threat. So basically when you say many species are facing a significant threat, this is evidence to prove that part. So we are saying that many species are facing a significant threat due to human activity, habitat loss and many other things and we need to take steps to prevent this from happening. These two last two lines essentially show how many uh, animal species are at risk. So they are uh, essentially adding uh, weight to this part of the paragraph, this part claim that many species are facing extinction as such, a significant threat to their survival. So essentially the underlying part is evidence, it is evidence to support a claim that is made in the paragraph. So now that we know uh, the uh, role played that by that particular lines, so let's take a look at the options. In the above argument, the portion in bold phase, uh, phase plays which of the following roles in the argument. Statement is evidence that uh, has been used to weaken a claim made in the argument. No, it is strengthening the claim, it is not weakening it. The argument, main argument is that we have to do something to prevent uh, the extinction of species. So it is not uh, uh, weakening, it is in fact strengthening the claim. So A is incorrect. The, offer, uh, the statement offers evidence opposing the argument. No, it offers evidence supporting the argument. So B is also incorrect. The statement has been used to support a claim made in the argument. Exactly true. The claim is that we are, uh, many species are facing extinction and this actually supports that claim. So this is true. The statement is the primary claim made in the argument. No, the primary claim is that uh, many species are facing extinction. This is essentially used to support that claim. This is the main claim, this is the main argument and this is evidence used to support that claim. So D is also not true. The statement provides evidence in support of the position that the argument seeks to reject. The argument is not seeking to reject any position. The argument is making a positive position and this is an evidence in support of that positive position. So even E is incorrect, C is clearly the correct answer. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT points video series. In the following uh, critical reasoning question, we are asked to find out which conclusion can be drawn. So a conclusion is not given. We are given a lot of information and then we are asked to find out which conclusion can be drawn from the information that is there. A recent study published in the Journal of American Medical Association investigated the relationship between daily fruit consumption and the incidence of type 2 diabetes. The study included a large sample of adults over the age of 40 and controlled for several potential confounding factors such as gender, body mass index and physical activity levels. The results of the study showed compared to individuals who did not consume food on, uh, fruit on a daily basis, those who consumed at least two servings of fruit per day had a significantly uh, lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So essentially a study is being described, the conditions of the study are described and the result is that if you eat uh, two servings of the diabetes, it was seen that the group that ate two servings of the diabetes had uh, two servings of fruit had uh, lower risk of developing diabetes as compared to the other group which did not have the fruit. So essentially two groups are found, one group uh, showed a lesser incidence or lesser risk of diabetes than the other group this group was taking fruit as such. So that has been given. The study has been controlled for gender, body mass index and physical activity levels. So essentially that has been eliminated. But the group is mostly about uh, people about the age of 40 as such. Okay. So that is the setup or the, uh, uh, the experimental setup is given. So what can you infer about from the result of the uh, uh, this as such? From the result of uh, this, you can see that we are seeing that uh, those who ate two servings of uh, fruit had a uh, uh, were seen to like the that is correlated with having lesser chance of a lesser risk of developing diabetes while those who did not eat uh, two bowls of fruit had a greater chance or had a greater uh, were uh, there was a correlation between them and a greater chance of developing type 2 diabetes now let us take a look at the options and we'll see which of these is scientifically uh, uh, scientifically uh, correct given the information that is given. Whenever you are making scientific conclusions, you have to be very, very careful. You can't make any kind of exaggerated uh, conclusions as such. So let us take a look at the options. Uh, consuming two uh, servings of fruit per day prevents the development of type 2 diabetes. Now prevents the development of type 2 diabetes means that it is 100% correlated. That is if you eat fruit, there was no chance of having diabetes, which is not what is given in the uh, paragraph as such, you had less chance of de developing diabetes, less chance does not mean zero chance, that is first thing. And we don't know whether it was like causal as such, it didn't, uh, we don't know whether 
that group didn't develop the or had lesser chance of developing diabetes because of eating fruit it could be other factors related to it but we we can't say whether it was because of the fruit that they didn't develop or had lesser chance of developing uh, diabetes but the first thing is that lesser uh, significantly lower risk has been made into zero risk which is not the case significantly lower risk can even mean if you say if your risk of developing diabetes goes down from 40% to 20% even that is a significant reduction but again 20% doesn't mean that you will never have type 2, type 2 diabetes so a is clearly incorrect because it uh, distorts what is given in the passage the results of the study demonstrate a causal relationship between fruit consumption and the risk of type 2 diabetes what the study found was that a and b occurred together eating fruit and lesser risk of diabetes occurred together now if two things occur together we can think that it could be that okay a is causing b or b is causing a or there is a common factor which is causing both of those things so for example consider in this particular paragraph it could be that uh, if you take the time out to think about your health and you eat those two portions of fruit it could mean that just doing that mental activity or taking that step to be uh, cognizant of your health actually changed your mindset in a way that you were more careful about what you ate otherwise also or because you ate fruit you did not eat other unhealthy food and that in turn led to a reduction in uh, the chance of diabetes so a causing b cannot be determined just from the fact that both of them occur together there could be a common factor that essentially caused both or there could be some other factor which is in uh, if uh, this essentially caused another factor and that essentially is uh, a causal factor for people to develop a uh, lower risk of diabetes so we can't say that eating fruit in some way that uh, the act of eating fruit essentially uh, reduced your uh, levels of diabetes uh, or chance of getting diabetes that cannot be inferred so the causal link cannot be established just by seeing that both of them occur together generally whenever you have a scientific uh, evidence it is uh, most of the scientific evidence saying that okay this occurs together this occurs rarely together it just shows that there is correlation an additional step has to be taken place to support causation so correlation does not imply causation but causation would imply correlation so correlation is like a lower level of evidence causation is a higher level of evidence which shows that okay if a uh, you took two fruits and now suppose now you stopped and now your risk increase then you can say okay there is a causal link also so there is a higher level of evidence that is required to establish causation than simple correlation and that amount or that uh, level of evidence has not been reached by the information given so causal link cannot be established so option b can be eliminated the relationship between fruit consumption and the risk of type 2 diabetes is completely unrelated to other factors such as age bmi and uh, physical activity levels no this is not true they are controlling for other factors but if those factors come into play you can't really tell anything about the relationship between these two factors as such those two factors essentially have been used as control because those two factors are potentially severe risk factors to developing uh, diabetes as such your bmi if you have very high bmi that would probably be a contributing factor towards diabetes so it's not that it's unrelated you need to control for those factors so that you can actually get a uh you can actually compare across groups because if you are not controlling for those two factors then your experiments results are in doubt as such so c is not at all something that you can uh, uh conclude based on the information given the study shows a correlation but not a causation between fruit consumption and the risk of type 2 diabetes this is exactly what can be concluded based on the study that is a, there's a correlation between fruit consumption and lower risk of diabetes but we cannot see say whether it is a causal link as such the results of the study apply to all individuals regardless of age bmi or physical activity levels age is the trick over here because we have been given that they are over 40 so it might not apply to all uh, ages it might not apply to those who are in their 20s it might not have any impact uh, eating fruit might not have any impact in your 20s as such so we can't infer uh, this uh, conclusion based on what is given in the uh, study because the study specifically looked at people over 40 so e is incorrect d is the only uh, correct conclusion that can be drawn so the correct answer is option d hi friends welcome to gmat points video series i'm saili kale In this particular video we have a uh, sentence correction question where we are asked to correctly phrase the underlined part of the sentence so let's take a look at the sentence 
The music teacher is thrilled to find that finally after many years, here are a group of aspiring as, uh, musicians focusing on technique rather than the field. So here we have like different choices. Let us see the split based on the options that are there. Here are, here is, here is, here are, here are. So there is a is versus are split over here. And then you have group of is, aspiring musicians focusing, focusing who focus, who focus and who had focus. So the other option is between focusing, who focus and who, who had focused. Okay. So these are the choices that we have to make. Now firstly between is and are, is is the singular, uh, pro, uh, singular verb, are is the plural verb. Now you have to identify what is this being described. So what is being described here is a group or here are a group is basically uh, uh, is singular, R is plural. Here we are describing a group of musicians. So when you consider a group of musicians, especially when you are describing them as a single unit, which has the same characteristic, a group which is behaving cohesively is considered as a singular noun. Now if it is a singular noun, it is going to take the uh, singular form of the verb is, which means that is is correct, R is incorrect. So using that, I can eliminate option A, option E, and option D as such. We are left with options B and C. Now the options uh, who had focus is also gone. So it is the op uh, choice between focusing and who focus as such. If you say here is a group of aspiring musicians focusing on technique rather than fame versus who focus on technique rather than fame. So focusing on technique rather than fame means that they are currently focusing on technique. If you say who focus, if you use the simple present uh, tense as such, you indicate that this is something that happens regularly. You indicate that they uh, value technique over fame. They do this at, uh, at all times as such. Now, would a music teacher be thrilled only if they are focusing at the moment on uh, technique or would he be happy if they focus all the time on technique over fame? He would be happy if they uh, are like doing this at all times as such, not just currently. From the meaning of the sentence, we understand that the, he is happy to have them because they prefer uh, put more importance on technique than fame. So it is something that they do habitually or at all times, which means that we have to use the simple present tense, who focus rather than focusing. So clearly the correct answer is option C. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT points video series. I'm Saili Kale. Uh, so in front of us is a sentence correction question where we have to find out the correct way of uh, phrasing the underlined sentence. So let's take a look at the sentence. The basketball club, one of the newest at the university, has more advanced training facilities and equipment than any club due to its increasing success and the players demand for professional leagues. Now here clearly this sentence doesn't make sense because players demand for professional leagues doesn't make sense. Professional leagues have demand for players, not players demands for professional leagues doesn't make sense. So clearly this is incorrect as such. Now before that, let us take a look at the uh, options and let us try to split them ac according to that. Any club, any other club, any club, any other club. So you have two choices, any club or any other. Due to its increasing uh, success, due to its increasing success, because of its increasing success, because of its increasing success, due to its. So either it is due to or because of, you have a choice over there also. And the players demand for professional leagues uh, and the demand for players, its players in the professional leagues, players demands, players uh, demand for its players, demand players demand. See clearly players demands, demand for its players. Now let us take a look at these two, sent this part, players demand and demand for its what they are saying is that they have a state of the art training facility because they have money and they have money because uh, different outside professional leagues are paying them and they are paying them because their players are sought after. So that is basically why they have state of the art training facilities and uh, more uh, equipment than any other club. So basically it's not the players who are making the demand, it's the professional leagues who are making the demand for the players. So based on the meaning of the sentence, you can eliminate this option. It has to be this particular option. There is a lot of demand for its players and because of that, they have state of the art training facilities. So I can eliminate this one, I can eliminate uh, this one and I can eliminate this one. So I'm left with options B and D. So you have the difference between uh, due to and because of. Uh, again, when you have any or any other, remember that uh, whenever you are comparing between uh, one club and saying that this has more things than anything, 
anyone else as such you have to basically say any other club or any one other club as such essentially when you are comparing you have to basically say uh, instead of saying just any club you have to say any other club as such to show that this has the most amount of facilities so any is incorrect any other would be the right format as such but again in bnd both any other is there so it doesn't help so essentially now it boils down to the choice between due to and because of now due to is basically used uh, when we are modifying a particular uh, uh, noun phrase and it has to be uh, close to that uh, as such. So, uh, the uh, attendance was low due to uh, uh, the rains or the attendance was low due to the uh, snowstorm. So, the attendance is uh, the fact that we have low attendance, uh, the due to part has to be immediately next to it. If it is separated, then you can't use due to anymore because uh, then you will have a misplaced modifier. So, essentially whenever you have a sentence where the uh, cause and the effect are uh, separated, you should not use due to, you should use because of. In this particular case, consider it's uh, what is being modified due to its increasing success. Whose increasing success is being referred to? It is uh, you are referring to the increasing success of any other club or you are referring to the success of the basketball club as such. Here you are referring to the uh, success of the basketball club as such. So, in this particular case, the use of due to will be incorrect. You can't use due to because the uh, what it is referring to, it is being separated from it. So, the, because of that, we have to use option uh, because of and not due to. So, the correct option is option D. And uh, this is incorrect, we have to use because of. So, the correct answer to choose is option D. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT points video series. Uh, in this particular sentence correction question, we have a parallelism uh, question. So, let us take a look at the sentence. Each group of students in the after school program are required to complete a community service project which could include organizing a fundraiser for a local charity, helping to maintain a community garden or assistance with events at a nursing home. See whenever a list is given automatically your brain should say that yeah this is about parallel structure and parallelism and there is also a uh, option between is and are. So if you take a look at uh, the split as such you have is uh, given for two options and are given for two options. So, let us first make the decision between is and are. So, is is the singular form of the uh, uh, verb and are is the plural form. Who is being described? Each group of students is, uh, is required or are required. So, each group of students is singular. When you say each, it is singular. So, that means that is required is correct, are required is incorrect. So, this should be is required. So, that means I can eliminate options A, C and E and only B and D are left. So, this is the first split is required to complete a community service project which could include organizing uh, for a local charity, helping to maintain a community garden or assisting with events at a uh, this. So, now we are uh, we have is required is required and everything else is the same. Now, we come to the list as such. In option D, we have the uh, gerund form of the work organizing a fundraiser, helping to maintain a, a, a community garden, assisting with events. And in the case of option D, you have organizing, but the others are not maintaining an assistance. They are in a different noun form as such. So, because uh, there is no parallel structure in the list as such, option B is correct. Option D has a parallelism error. So, the correct option to choose is option B. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT points video series. In front of us is a sentence correction question where we have to find the right way of uh, uh, phrasing the underlined portion. So, let us take a look at the uh, sentence. The ideologies of Indian revolutionaries, the men and women who fought for the nation's independence has been thoroughly analyzed in a growing amount of historical text. If I look at the options, there is a split between has been and have been. So, the first uh, uh, split that I see is the split between has and have. So, if we have to choose whether it should be has been or have been. Then you have a split between thoroughly, thoroughly analyzed and analyzed thoroughly. So, that should be the second split that we have. Uh, and uh, essentially, should it be thoroughly analyzed or analyzed thoroughly? Again, uh, it does not make much of a difference. So, let us, uh, but we will keep it for now. I think both of them are correct. And then lastly, we have a growing amount or growing number. So, that is the third split between number and amount. Now, let us first take a look at whether it should be has or have. 
So you have the ideologies of Indian revolutionaries. So ideologies of the Indian revolutionaries is a plural subject. Ideologies is plural. So you it should take the plural verb. So instead of has, you should have have. So this should be have been thoroughly uh, analyzed. So essentially, uh, I can eliminate every uh, option which has has. So A, B and D can be eliminated. I am left with C and E. Have been th uh, thoroughly analyzed. So this is gone. Thoroughly analyzed is only left. So I can eliminate this clearly. Now between number and amount, growing amount and growing number. See, amount is taken whenever there is an uncountable noun. Amount of water, amount of space, amount of time. But whenever we have countable nouns like books, like uh, uh, text, etc., then it has to be, uh, whenever it is a countable uh, noun, it has to be number. So it should be growing number and not growing amount because text is a countable noun as such. So number is correct, amount is incorrect, which would mean that option C is incorrect, option E is the right answer. So the correct answer is option E. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT Points video series. I am Saili Kale. In this particular question, we are asked to find out the correct way of phrasing the underlined portion. So let's take a look at the sentence. The pyramids of Giza, a complex of ancient Egyptian pyramids, was built around 2500 BC and is considered one of the oldest and most well-preserved ancient landmarks in the world. So let us take a look at the split as such. A complex of ancient uh, this or complex of this. So a complex of ancient in Egyptian pyramids is same throughout. Was built, were built, was built, were built. So first split we have is between was and were. So what is being described over here? This is entirely, this modifier can be removed completely. That is essentially separating the subject, which is the pyramids of Giza from the verb, which is was. So pyramids of Giza is essentially multiple pyramids. It is uh, several structures. So because it is uh, different pyramids, many pyramids are there. It is a plural subject. And because it's a plural subject, it should take a plural verb. So instead of was, we should have were. The pyramids of Giza were built around 2500 BC. So that eliminates option A, option C, option E. We are left with options B and D as such. Were built around 2500 BC. And now let us take a look at the options and are considered one of the oldest and most well preserved. And is considered, okay, is and are is the sp uh, second split, is and are. Now as you can see, uh, if you have plural over at was, uh, if was was singular, then is would have been right. But because were is uh, correct, uh, you should have plural verbs throughout. So pyramids of Giza uh, were built around this and are considered uh, the oldest and most well-preserved this. So was is, in, uh, is is incorrect because it is singular. R would be the correct uh, uh, form of the verb for pyramids of Giza. Option B is correct. Option uh, D is incorrect because is is used over here. So this is the correct answer. The correct answer is option B. So whenever you have questions of this, just use the splits, figure out which choices you have to make and then it becomes easy to answer questions of this type. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT Points video series. I am Saili Kale. In this particular uh, sentence correction question, we are asked to correctly find the uh, correct form of the underlined sentence. So let's take a look at the sentence. During the peak of renaissance, when the Vatican library was expanding its collection of rare manuscripts, Skilled scribes trained in the art of calligraphy and bookbinding were essential in preserving and creating new works. So you have like the sp uh, splits that are given. Firstly, one option is skilled scribes. The other option is trained in calligraphy before skilled scribes as such. Now trained in calligraphy or art of calligraphy is a modifier which is essentially describing skilled scribes. If you put this in front of uh, just after rare man manuscripts, it would, be, it would be a misplaced modifier because it would look like it is essentially modifying rare manuscripts. But manuscripts can't be trained in art of calligraphy. So trained in art of calligraphy and manuscripts, uh, calligraphy and book binding should come after skill scribes because it is describing skill scribes as such. So this part which is placing that modifier before the subject is incorrect. Similarly, this is also incorrect. So we are left with A, C and E. Let us take a look at the uh, split between them. There is also a were versus was split. Here you have were, here you have was, here we have were. Okay. So essentially two, uh, three options are given. Essentially what is this uh, verb referring to? This verb is referring to scribes. Scribes were essential. Scribes were needed. Now scribes is a plural uh, noun because it's referring to more than one scribes. It's a plural noun as such. So if it is a plural noun, it should take a plural verb 
so that basically means that you cannot uh, have was you must have were so essentially c also can be eliminated so now we are left with a and b now we are uh, we get uh, between a and e there's another split you have trained in in the case of a and you have familiar in in the case of e now the correct preposition to put after familiar is essentially with familiar with the art of calligraphy familiar in is incorrect so the correct phrase to use is trained in the art of calligraphy or familiar with the art of calligraphy so e is incorrect a would be the correct option so the correct option to choose is option a hi friends welcome to gmat points video series i am saili kale in this particular question we are required to find out the correct way of tracing the underlined portion of the sentence and the underlined portion of the sentence has many modifiers so the uh, important thing to do is basically know which modifier should go where so that there is no confusion about what it is modifying so let's take a look at the sentence as a part of the repatriation program including the golden trophy head a, spectac uh, a spectacular piece of the asante regalia the british museum has announced that it would return many of the ghanian artifacts that it now possesses looted by the british in the late 1800s now it is all of a jumble at the moment so it makes no sense but essentially what has happened is the british Mu museum has announced that it is going to return many ghanian artifacts including the golden trophy head which is a spectacular piece of the asante regalia so firstly this part which is the uh, that the uh, british museum has announced this particular thing has to come first so this part essentially should come first so from the given options we can directly eliminate option a and option e because the british Mu museum announced that it would return many of that should definitely come first because otherwise it makes no sense uh, in the part of the repatriation program first you have to say what they are going to do as part of the repatriation program and then this remaining part is referring to a specific part that is the golden trophy head which is a spectacular piece of asante regalia so from b c and e also there is a switching between the uh, which uh, of them comes first so here you have that a spectacular piece of asante regalia including the golden trophy head so here again the these two orders are kind of uh, uh, interchange the golden trophy head is a spectacular piece of asante regalia so the fact that it is that including that should come first the modifier should come after the thing that it is modifying has come so because uh, otherwise it doesn't make sense what is a spectacular piece of asante regalia the golden trophy head so that should come first so e also can be eliminated e, e is also incorrect so that leaves us with b and c so you are given that the british museum announced this it would return many of it now let us take a look at the splits between b and c as such including the gold uh, that it now possesses uh, including the golden trophy head and uh, uh, this now again basically uh, the uh, split is basically between that it now possesses uh, in b and that as its possession in c now who possesses the ghanian artifacts the british museum now if you put it over here if you put it over here as in b it is difficult to tell what it is modifying it is modifying the british museum it is modifying that the british museum is uh, possessing these ghanian artifacts now if you put it at the end of the sentence it is again a, uh, uh, this of misplaced modifier the fact that it now possesses that should be closer to the subject which is the british museum after you introduce the golden trophy etc etc then it is uh, it becomes uh, kind of muddy it uh, becomes unclear what exactly that it now possesses is uh, modifying so the correct form of the sentence is option c the british museum announced that it would return many of the ghanian artifact that it now possesses including the golden trophy head a spectacular piece of of the asante regalia so the, the correct option to choose is option c so this is the correct answer hi friends welcome to gmat points video series i am saili kale in this particular uh, question we have to find out the correct way of phrasing the underlined portion and uh, we see a lot of uh, splits across the options as such let's take a look at the sentence first the archaeologists were amazed at the discovery of a previously known unknown ancient city that shed light on the history and culture of the civilization it is likely to result in increased funding for excavation projects so essentially the split firstly that we see is between that and which you have three options with which you have two options with that 
whenever you have a sentence if you have a uh, direct sentence okay uh, the train that got late arrived finally arrived at the platform if it is a complete sentence without any there is no comma as such if the uh, like the uh, if there is no comma that is separating the uh, clause from the uh, main uh, sentence or the uh, subject as such then you have to use that if you are uh, forming a clause by using a comma if you are forming a, uh, a subordinate clause by using a comma then you have to use which since a comma has been placed the usage of that is incorrect you have to use which so that is the first split as such so uh, between that and which we have to use which because the comma has been placed now let us take a look at the second split is that uh, that is there which shed light on the history and culture which shed light on the history and culture of the civilization so this like second split is after the semicolon it will likely result uh, result in increased funding for this this discovery is likely to result in this will cause now which of these is the correct way of phrasing as such so whenever you have the semicomma uh, semicolon as such after the semicolon the sentence of the after the semicolon should be able to stand as an independent sentence it should have a subject it should have a verb and it should be if you take that sentence out also it should make sense as such in this case if you say it will likely result in or this will cause it is un, uh, it is not clear exactly what you are referring to you are referring to the discovery of the previously unknown uh, ancient city right but if you remove the uh, uh, because this is a separate sentence as such if you uh, remove that sentence from the uh, immediate sentence as such it will be unclear uh, what exactly it or this is referring to so the correct way of phrasing this would be this discovery is likely to result in so that you have to repeat the subject so that it is clear it is unambiguous what you are referring to so d is the correct way of phrasing the sentence so d is the correct option Hi friends, welcome to GMAT Points video series. I am Sally Kale. So this is a sentence correction question, and we have to find the correct way of phrasing the underlined sentence. So let's take a look at the sentence. Uh, the variety of Kashmiri apple, though a fruit uh, known for its superior taste and quality, have declined over time due to substandard agricultural practices. And to keep it thriving, farmers will need to reevaluate their cultivation strategies. So a sentence part of the sentence is given, and uh, different uh, ways of phrasing that part are given. So let us try to use the method of uh, splitting. Which uh, split is correct? So there are two splits that I can uh, one split that I can see immediately. That is uh, though a fruit, that form of phrasing, or just a fruit, or having been a fruit. Now here. we are saying that uh, it, the kashmiri apple is known for its superior taste and quality but the variety has declined over time now in that case basically it's not that it has been a fruit or having been the firstly the form of uh, like uh, continuous uh, uh, like uh, uh, like present continuous in this particular sense does not make sense because it is something that is occurring at uh, at all times as such it is something that should be in present tense as such so this is clearly wrong because the uh, incorrect tense is used similarly if you see though a fruit or just a simply a fruit should do though is used whenever you are introducing a contradiction but there is no contradiction over here the kashmiri apple is a fruit known for its superior taste but its variety has declined the uh, apple itself has not declined in quality as such so though it is known for superior taste and quality its variety has declined over time so the contradiction is not there and if the contradiction is not there the usage of though is incorrect the correct form to choose is a fruit so we can eliminate option a option c and option e as such so it should be a, a fruit known for its superior taste and quality has declined have declined so the second split that i see is has versus have now what is this verb referring to the verb is referring to the variety the variety has declined now variety is a singular noun so has declined is correct have declined is incorrect so the variety has declined over time due to substandard agricultural practices so option b is the right answer hi friends welcome to gmat points video series i am sali kale in this particular uh, sentence correction question we have to find the right way of phrasing the underlined portion of the sentence so let's take a look at the sentence the existence of strange carvings on the mountains in tibet remain a subject of immense interest for anthropologists who have debated on its potential origin since the early 1980s so your first split that you see across the option is remain or remains now remain is a verb which is referring to what the existence has uh, is a subject of immense interest 
the existence so this remain refers to the subject which is existence now existence is singular the existence of something is a singular now uh, either you exist or you don't exist the existence of the stone carvings is a sing uh, singular noun so if this is singular then you have to use the singular form of the verb which is remains the existence of the strange carvings on the mountains in tibet remains a subject of immense interest so remain can be eliminated all the options with remain can be eliminated so a c and d are eliminated we are left with only b and e remains a subject of immense interest for anthropologists the next split is between having debated its potential origin and who have debated its potential origin now essentially in this case uh, what uh, how when you remove the uh, uh, this as such if you say that okay uh, anthropologist if you are uh, modifying anthropologist uh, you have to say that the anthropologist have debated its potential origin the next part is essentially a modifier for anthropology the anthropologists have uh, like debated the origin of these carvings for a long time having debated is uh, incorrect construction because it is unclear who they are actually uh, what that particular phrase is modifying you are modifying the anthropologist so you have to basically say who have debated essentially again this is not uh, something that is occurring in a continuous tense the, uh, it is not something that should be in past continuous form also so the tense is also incorrect firstly we need the uh, presence of the pronoun who to indicate that we are, we are referring to the anthropologist secondly we have to say that this is in past uh, uh, perfect tense so you should have have debated not having debated so because of both of these reasons e is the correct form of the sentence b is incorrect so the correct option to choose is option e Hi friends, welcome to GMAT Points video series. I'm Saili Kale. In this particular uh, video, we'll be discussing a reading comprehension question based on the American education system and basically the difficulty students have for paying for higher education. So let's take a look at the passage. The American higher education system appears broken for all but the most well-off. Selective colleges are receiving more applications than ever before, fueling the impressions that Americans of all sort are aiming for elite college experience. But the rise of applications is partly the result of the same students sending applications to more schools as a recent report shows. So basically, uh, the author is highlighting that there is an issue with the American higher education system. The uh, rise in applications should not uh, fool one into thinking that things are going well and people are applying for a higher education. There, are, there is something seriously wrong with it. So author uh, highlighting. How? current higher ed system broken now let's take a look at the next paragraph already stretched families hesitate to extend themselves more students who borrow for higher education but fail to complete their degrees struggle the most to pay back the money this group includes disproportionately high numbers of people of color and low income individuals. Among those enrolled full time, 40% of black students and 54% of Latino students do not attain bachelor's degrees within six years, compared with about two thirds of white students. Families who make about who fail to make payments on college debt risk their wages being garnished, their income tax refunds being withheld and their credit scores being lowered which can make it difficult to obtain leases and can lead to higher interest rate on other loans. So essentially the difficulty that is being uh, discussed over here is that how difficult it is for certain people to pay for higher education and many people who uh, take out educational loans to uh, pay for uh, higher education end up not being able to pay them because they, are, uh, they drop out of uh, this and the number of people who are from lower income uh, backgrounds or people of color who actually drop out is much higher. So this affects them disproportionately higher and if you fail to make your uh, repayments on the educational loan there are a host of other things other ways in which it affects your life as such. So essentially uh, difficulty this paragraph highlights the difficulty in paying for higher ed uh, uh, the uh, essentially this difficulty is especially felt by those by uh, the uh, people of color and uh, low income individuals and the impact that this has the inability to pay for it what impact it has on their life so this is essentially being discussed how it is difficult to pay for higher education and even if you take an educational loan many people struggle to pay back the loan and if you don't pay back the loan it has a host of impact on your life as such 
Now let's take a look at the next paragraph. In recent decades, the US has made an attempt to narrow persistent race and income based inequalities in educational attainment by helping students of different backgrounds access loans. Now the Bi Biden administration is trying to cancel some of that debt. Historically, states issued more assistance to post-secondary institutions and students than federal government did. But in recent years, the amount of funding supplied by states has dropped. So with uh, respect to how you are going to be able to pay for this system, a couple of factors are mentioned. There are two positive factors, one negative factor mentioned. So the two positive are basically the access to educational loan has improved. Uh, the Biden government is also working towards cancelling some of the educational debt. However, the state funding that used to be high has kind of dropped as such. So two positive factors improving the ability to, of people to pay for loans and get higher education and one factor which is actually having a negative impact as such. Uh, factors affecting uh, people's ability to ability to get higher ed and pay off debt. So essentially, uh, this is uh, referring to the finances involved in paying for higher education. Two things that happened recently helped in a way. But one thing which is happening is kind of acting as a negative. Uh, this. So essentially, there is a real problem in higher education in the fact that a lot of people are not able to afford it. Those people who take out educational loans, we see that though, uh, many people struggle to pay off the educational loans, especially people of color and those from lower income backgrounds because they are more likely to drop out. And once you drop out, it becomes much more difficult to pay off the loan and even uh, once you are not able to pay off the educational loan it impacts your uh, life and your ability to earn in different different ways that your uh, wages are garnished or your uh, uh, income tax refunds are held back all of the other things that happens once you are not able to pay for your loan pay back your loan and uh, things have kind of improved and also kind of deteriorated in certain way when it comes to this particular aspect so the entire passage is essentially about the american higher education system and the difficulties people face in paying for it there is a huge issue with people paying for it especially those who are poor and those who come uh, people of color have difficulty paying off the educational loans that they take and how it affects their life is essentially being discussed. So now that we understand what the passage is about, let's take a look at the question. The question, uh, first question is, which of the following, if true, would strengthen the claim that students who borrow for higher education but fail to complete their degrees, struggle the most to pay back the money? So we are saying the claim is that if you drop out from college, you are much more likely to struggle paying back for the ed educational loan than if you actually get the degree. That claim has been made and we have to see which one actually bolster the claim. So essentially, the between two groups, those who drop out and those who graduate, we have to be able to show that this group has much more difficulty paying back the loan than the guys who graduate as such. Anything which essentially supports this or shows a distinction in the ability to pay back or the difficulty faced by one group versus the other would help our cause. So let's take a look at the options. Students who borrow for higher education and complete their degrees have higher salaries than those who do not. Now here the point of discussion is not uh, what your salaries are. Again, higher salaries would reduce the difficulty in paying back. That is definitely there. But if your uh, educational debt is small enough, even with a lower salary, you will be able to pay it off as such. So higher salary does not necessarily equate to lesser difficulty and lower salary does not necessarily equate to very high difficulty in paying off unless the educational loan is a big amount as compared to your salary. So essentially, this slightly strengthens the claim, but we need extra information. We need not just the salary, but a salary with respect to the amount that they have to pay down each time or the difficulty of low salary with the debt as such. So without that information, we can't uh, say this does much to strengthen the cost. It does slightly strengthen, but not much. So I'd say this is like a maybe. Let's take a look at options B, C, D, E and E. Uh, the majority of students who borrow for higher education complete their degrees within six years. Now, if this is the case, basically we are saying that most of the people belong to this group and very few people belong to this group. Again, uh, then uh, even if that is the case, it actually indicates that there is a very small percentage of people who are actually dropping out. And then to make the case that the dropouts struggle more than graduate, it's, it's difficult to make the case as such based on this information. If anything, it shows that... Uh, 
the problem of dropouts not being able to pay for their education isn't very widespread because most of the people graduate anyway. So this doesn't actually uh, speak to the difficulty the dropouts face. This just basically says that the number of dropouts is very, very little. So again, uh, B does not do anything to strengthen the claim. If, an, if anything, it actually weakens the claim slightly by saying that there aren't that many people who drop out anyway. So B also uh, can be eliminated. Uh, students who drop out default on student loans at a rate three times higher than those who graduate. Now here is this hard fact which actually supports the claim that the dropouts are not able to pay for their uh, de educational debt the same way as the gra uh, graduates are. They default at three times the uh, rate of graduates which basically means that they are having great difficulty in paying for the loan. You will drop, uh, you will default on the loan only if you are unable to pay for the loan. Especially if it's a loan where you don't have a choice uh, to uh, whether to pay or not when your wages are being garnished. The only way you would actually default on the loan is if you are not having proper, uh, uh, you, if you are unable to pay for it. And this essentially indicates that they find it much more difficult. Uh, uh, they've struggled much more to pay back the money than the graduate. So C is essentially giving a factual evidence to back up the claim. And this as compared to A is a much more direct factual evidence to show that this is the case. So C, I would say, would be a strong evidence in to strengthen the claim that is given. The cost of tuition at public universities has increased significantly over the past decade. Even if this is true, it would affect both parts equally. We are not saying low income versus high income or we are not saying the two groups aren't based on the ability to pay. It's basically dropout versus graduate and D would affect or impact both of them equally. So again, it would not be a dif distinguishing factor. Most students who borrow for higher education receive some form of financial aid. Again, if this is true, this would actually make it uh, seem that you shouldn't struggle to pay back the loans. So again, between these two, there is no distinction and you can't make the uh, conclusion that dropouts will struggle more. In fact, if you are getting financial aid, you shouldn't be struggling as much. So E, if anything, weakens the claim. It definitely doesn't strengthen the claim. A slightly strengthens. C is a very significant evidence in favor of the claim. So C would be the right answer. The passage is primarily concerned with, so we have to find out what is the main purpose or the primary point of the passage. How the increase in the number of applications to elite colleges is making it more difficult for students from middle income backgrounds to gain acceptance. This is not at all discussed in the passage, completely tangential to the discussion. The discussion is about how it is very, uh, people are finding it difficult to pay for higher education, especially people who are from poorer backgrounds, people who are people of color are finding it very difficult. And this is essentially leading it, uh, even if they take educational loans, they are finding it difficult to pay for those educational loans. It is about the financial aspect of higher education, not about acceptance at all. So A can easily be eliminated. The issue in the American higher education system, particularly the difficulty faced by financially disadvantaged students in repaying student loans. Exactly the point. The issues uh, with the American higher education system are being highlighted, especially the fact that it is too expensive for many people. And it is uh, the even if they take educational loans, they are not able to repay the loans, especially the uh, disadvantaged people. So B is exactly the point as such. The ways in which the American higher education system is failing to properly prepare students for future career opportunities and how this is leading to issues with student loan repayment. This part that uh, prepare students for fu uh, future career opportunities, this is not at all discussed in the passage. The passage is not about how the degree should prepare you for a future. It is not concerned with that. The passage is concerned about how people are going to pay for this and how much they struggle to pay for the higher education. So C is incorrect. The history of the US government's policies regarding student loan forgiveness and how these policies have affected the overall student, -led debt, uh, student loan debt crisis in the country. The history is not given. One example is given of Biden forgiving, but the history of loan forgiveness is definitely not mentioned. So again, this is not the point that is being discussed at all. The attempt made by the Biden administration to cancel student loan debt and its impact on students. This is a very small part of what is discussed. Only in the last paragraph will you find a mention of this. And this isn't even the full last paragraph. And it is no way the main point of the passage as such. So E is also incorrect. B is capturing the main issue or the main point of discussion as such. So B is the right answer.
which of the following would be a valid criticism of the Biden administration's move to cancel some of the student loan debt. So, essentially they have decided to forgive some of the student loan debt. There is a debt uh, loan, student loan crisis, many people are struggling to pay for their loans and es essentially there is also a question of how to actually, uh, like people are struggling to uh, pay for it especially if they do not graduate. So, let us take a look at the options. Cancelling student loan debt is futile since students must learn to live with their choices and pay off their loans as part of adulting. Now, this is uh, essentially uh, in many ways, uh, historically students have gotten some funding, either state funding or federal funding according to the passage itself. Now, to say that okay, they people should pay for their own loans is not in line with what has historically happened. Historically, they have gotten help from the state government, from the federal government. So, A is not really a... Uh, uh, criticism of this move because this move is in line with what has happened earlier. So, A is incorrect. The Biden administration should not be cancelling student loan debt but instead should be focusing on creating jobs and boosting the economy. Now, this is true and this would actually help in the ability of people to pay for their educational loans. However, what we have seen is that this problem is especially bad for those who have dropped out those who are people of color and those who are uh, economically disadvantaged, they are facing a critical uh, uh, crisis as such and just improving the economy would not uh, like uh, uh, address the issue they are uh, facing as such. So, essentially while this would help, this is not a solution for what is uh, what uh, the crisis that is uh, currently being faced by a lot of people who have student loan debt. So, this is not a valid criticism because this move is essentially uh, the Biden administration's move is basically to alleviate the pressure felt by a lot of uh, people who are struggling to make uh, payments on their student loan debt. Uh, just improving the economy will not really help those people who are uh, in a crisis mode as such. So, B is not a valid criticism. Student loan debt is a problem that is created by lack of parental and personal financial education. Cancelling student loan debt will not address this problem. While this is true, and improving financial education is definitely a good thing which would improve the this. Essentially, the host of other factors are also mentioned about why this has occurred. And uh, it's not just about the lack of awareness, but it is also because of the fact that uh, many people are not able to pay for it. It might just be because it is very, very in, uh, unaffordable. So, it's not that it is that... Uh, 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 they don't know how to make good financial uh, decisions for themselves. But if all of in university education or quality in university education, if it is extremely expensive, even with financial education, you might not be able to afford it. So, there is a clear problem about the uh, ability for to pay for higher education. While this might help, this might help in uh, removing cases where you are making uh, incorrect decisions, it has not been indicated that this is the reason why they have not been able to pay and this would not be a valid criticism because the essentially the student loan uh, uh, forgiveness is basically to ease the current crisis that is facing the system. Many people are essentially struggling and falling behind and that is affecting their whole life as such. Now, basically increasing financial education is not going to help them. So, C is incorrect. Cancelling existing student debt up to a certain specific amount does nothing to help new students apply to and attend universities that will give them the greatest odds of success. This is exactly the case. So, there are two people who are affected by the lack of affordability of the current education system. Those who are currently applying, so the new students and the new students are apprehensive about how they will pay for this, especially if you are a person of color, if you are economically disadvantaged. And then there are those who have already gone through the college system and have accumulated accumulated a massive amount of student debt. So, both of them, this would address the needs of this particular group while ignoring the needs of this particular group. So, essentially just cancelling the existing debt does nothing to address what is a systemic problem. The author starts by saying there is something seriously broken with the American higher education system. You are not addressing the problem, you are only addressing the symptom. So, this alone, the loan forgiveness alone is not sufficient to actually address the problem and that is a valid criticism of the move. That you are not, not addressing the actual base of the problem, you are addressing one part of the symptom by leaving those who are also facing similar symptoms at uh, 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 with no help as such. So, D is a valid criticism. The government has no role in cancelling student loan debt. It should be left to the free market to determine how to handle student loan debt and it should not intervene in private financial matters. Now, this is incorrect. They have been funding for many years as such and student loan forgiveness is basically them providing funds to actually pay off some of the debt. So, it is not that they have never provided funds, they have a history of providing funds. So, E is also incorrect, that is not a valid criticism because it is not specific to the Biden administration's uh, 
current action. It is a, a criticism of all funding given by state or federal authorities. So, it is not specific to this current action because this current action is in line with what has happened before. So, E is also incorrect. D would be the right answer. Let us take a look at the fourth question. It can be understood from the passage that families failing to make payments on college debt could face all of the following issues except. So, let us see the issues that are this. Families who fail to make uh, payments on college debt risk their wages being garnished. This is given. Uh, wages being garnished, their income tax refunds being withheld. Okay, that is also given. Uh, their credit scores being lowered. Uh, this is yes, given. And... Uh, which might lead to which uh, which can make it difficult to obtain uh, leases also given and can lead to higher interest rates on other loans. It is not about acquiring loans, you will get a loan, but you will get much uh, a loan at a much higher rate than everybody else. So, essentially if you have existing student loan debt, while another person might get it for 5 percent or 6 percent, you will have to pay 12 percent because you have a poor credit score. So, essentially the poor credit score means that you will get a loan, but you will get a loan at extremely high uh, interest rates as such. So, E is not the problem. The problem is that difficulty in acquiring loans at a reasonable interest rate. Because that at a reasonable interest rate is missing, E would be the right option. Historically, states issued most, uh, more assistance to post-secondary institutions and students than federal government did. So, here the person has said that states give more money to post and uh, the uh, like colleges and students than the uh, federal government does. Which of the following if true would weaken the above claim? So, basically we have to say that we have to say that state gives more and fed gives less to the group of colleges plus students. Okay. So, if we can show this or uh, if we can show that this uh, condition is not true, then we have gotten the right answer. According to a report by the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, the federal government has historically provided more uh, need-based financial aid to students than the states have. Now, this is basically talking about one subsection of the students, which is those who have a need-based uh, this. So, the, basically those who are extremely poor or disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged, the Fed has given more money than the states have. But even if that is the case, on the whole, colleges and students might be getting more money from the state than the Feds. So, just the fact that Feds are giving more money to a section of students does not invalidate this particular claim. So, A is not something that weakens the above claim. An analysis by the college board found that the states have allocated a larger share of their budgets for student financial aid than the federal government has historically. This, if in, if it is true, would in a way uh, strengthen the claim only. It would not weaken the claim at all. It would say that, okay, the state government is uh, giving at least a larger share of its budget. We don't know its budget with respect to Fed, but at least this is strengthening the claim rather than weakening it. So, I can eliminate option B easily. A survey by the National Education Board found that over the past 50 years, the federal government has allocated a larger portion of its budget than the states when it comes to building projects at public universities. So, here like the A was referring to a portion of students, here it is referring to a specific in expenditure of colleges that is building of public uh, uh, building of public projects or public uh, building projects at public universities. So, when you give money to colleges, it can be for a host of factors. Here, the author is basically saying the feds gave more money than states to build uh, uh, buildings in uh, universities, public universities as such. So, again, this is basically referring to a fraction or part of the money given to colleges. So, even if a part of the money given to uh, colleges is more for, from fed than state, the overall uh, money that they get might be greater than from the state than the fed as such. If the state gives more money to the students, if the state gives more money for like the educational faculty, etc, etc, then the particular statement would still stand. So, C is also incorrect. According to the research by the Pew Charitable Trust, over the past few decades, states per student funding yearly was on average 30 percent less than the federal government. Now, essentially here you are saying that the federal government per student spent more than the state. So, therefore, the amount given by the federal government to each student is 30 percent more than uh, like on average, the total amount given by the Fed uh, to students is 30 percent more than what they got from states. So, at least on students, at least one of these two, at least on students, the Fed gave more money and the state gave less money. So, this statement that uh, public institutions and students uh, 
uh, got more assistance from the states is incorrect. At the max, you would say that they, uh, the colleges or the post-secondary institutions got more money, but this part would be definitely refuted. That students got more money from states is definitely not true. In fact, the reverse is true. So, D, if it is true, does weaken the statement because it invalidates a part of the assertion made. Of the two assertions made, one part is completely invalidated. So, it does weaken the claim that is given. In other options, you had one part of colleges go, one part of students go, but entire colleges and entire students did not actually get uh, weakened. So, because in this case, all the students are like uh, the 30 percent of uh, like per student is given. So, if per student 30 percent less is given, then all students are if you consider all students versus all students, Fed is giving more money. So, at least a part of the sentence is definitely not true. So, the claim is being weakened. According to a study by the National Association of State Universities and Land Grant Colleges, states have invested more in higher education as a percentage of their budget than the federal government has. Now, even if this is the case, okay, uh, if this is the case, uh, this is in fact strengthening the claim that they gave more money. This is this does not weaken the claim that is given. So, E is clearly strengthening the claim. So, E can easily be eliminated. D would be the right answer. So, the correct answer to choose is option D. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT Points video series. I am Saili Kale. In front of us is a simple question on the not only but also format. So, let us take a look at the question. The Mayans who constructed impressive urban centers not only had a complex calendar and mathematical system and the underlying part is given and also were sophisticated farmers and craftsmen. Firstly, whenever not only is given that should always be followed with but also. And the second thing is that whatever is the format for this particular part, the same format has to be followed over here. So, firstly using the fact that it should be but also, we can remove this, this and this as such. Okay, And uh, again, if it is not were they only, then you would say but were also. But if it is only not only, then the format but were also can al also be eliminated. It has to be exact same parallel structure as such. Now, it, here in this uh, particular sentence, you have not only had something. So, here also you would have not, uh, but also had. So, using the second uh, uh, parallel construction this also, we can eliminate option C. You should have but also had a uh, parallel structure of sentence. So, because it is not only had a complex calendar and mathematical system, you should have but also had a sophisticated f uh, system of farming and craftsmanship. Only option B is parallel in structure to the sentence that is given after not only. So, the correct option to choose is option B. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT Points video series. I am Saili Kale. In this particular sentence correction question, we need basically two concepts. One is of subject verb agreement and the second concept is of parallel structure. So, let us take a look at the sentence. Improvements in infrastructure and transportation including the construction of new roads and expansion of public transportation options has allowed the mountain village to attract more visitors and redistributing the budget surplus for the benefit of the community. Now, what exactly uh, over here we see the first split between has and have. Three options have has, uh, two options have have. So, essentially what is being referred to? This verb refers to the improvements as such, improvements in infra infrastructure. That improvements in infrastructure is a plural uh, uh, subject. So, since it is a plural subject, it must take a plural verb. So, instead of has, we should have have. Improvements have produced this effect. These improvements have produced these effect as such. So, has is incorrect. So, because of that, we can eliminate first uh, A, B and D options. Have allowed the mountain village to attract more visitors and uh, dash uh, redistribute the budget surplus for the benefit of the community. So, two exact two effects of uh, getting more people into the village are given. One is that uh, two uh, effects of the improvements are given. First is the ability to attract and secondly redistribute the budget surplus to the for the benefit of the community. Now, whenever a list is given, even if the list is of two items, both items should have parallel structure. So, if you have attract more visitors, then you should have redistribute. So, in this case, you cannot have attract more visitors and redistributing. Uh, the tense of both of these verbs should be the same. So, if you have attract a simple present, then you should have redistribute, which is also in simple present tense. So, between C and D, we see redistribute over here, but uh, attracting over here and redistribute over here. Both of them should be either simple present or simple continuous. They cannot be of different tenses as such. Another more important thing is that, 
when you say allowed allowed should be followed by the preposition to i am allowed to do this i am not allowed with doing this so allowed here is uh, followed by the preposition with which is incorrect so you are allowed to attract more visitors and you are allowed to redistribute so c would be the right format right sentence e is grammatically incorrect so the correct option to choose is option c Hi friends, welcome to GMAT Points video series. In front of us is a question on sentence correction where we have to find out the right way of phrasing the underlined portion of the sentence. So let's take a look at the question. Given the fact that the lack of reliable transportation often hindered the movement of goods and people, the development of steam engine technology was essential to the advancement of industry just as the discovery of the compass was to the exploration world. So in the underlying part of the sentence, we have a comparison that the development of the steam engine was as important as the uh, discovery of the compass for the exploration of the world. As important as. So basically as important as and here uh, the simi uh, similarly the second part should also be the uh, in the same uh, uh, format as such. The development of this was as essential. You are comparing so as essential and here again uh, simply as should be there. The presence of just is wrong because you should basically the format would be as important and again as. As essential and again just simply as. Anything else in front of it is completely not necessary, it is incorrect. So in this case, the use of just is incorrect. Similarly, the use of as before essential is important. So let us take a look at the options. The development of steam engine was essential is incorrect. It should be as essential. Uh, was essential again is incorrect. The development of this was as essential to the development of industry just as. Just as is incorrect, so this is also can be eliminated. Uh, was a, as essential to the advancement of this, much as, much as is also incorrect. You should not uh, put much also in front of it. Uh, if you consider the last option, was as essential as the discovery of the compass. When you are saying as x as, you should just use as and as over here. It should not be much as, just as, nothing of that sort should be there in front of the second as. So only option E is correct. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT Points video series. In front of us is a sentence correction question where we have to find the correct way of phrasing the underlined portion of the sentence. The introduction of renewable energy sources which were created to reduce dependence on fossil fuels and address climate change have expanded beyond uh, personal use to include commercial and government uh, applications and have become readily accepted uh, despite some initial roadblocks. Now, the first split that I see is basically between the options there is a have versus has split. Firstly, in this part of the uh, sentence and over here. So, there are basically either options of to have or to has as such. So, let us first figure out whether it should be have or has. What is this verb referring to? Have refers to the introduction of renewable energy sources. So, introduction of renewable energy sources this is a singular noun. It refers to the introduction and introduction is a singular act. So, it is a singular noun. So, this should be has. So, we can eliminate all options which have have at the start. So, have, have uh, is eliminated, has expanded beyond personal use to include commercial and government applications and has become. And basically, this has, bas uh, because you have parallel structure, has expanded and has become uh, readily accepted. Now, you have a list, okay? And if you have a list, it should have parallel structure. So, you can't have has expanded and has have become. So, over here, when you have has expanded, this second verb should also be has because of parallel structure. This is has, this is have. Both of these are incorrect because both should be has as such. So, only option C is, in, uh, is correct. So, the correct option to choose is option C. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT Points video series. I am Saili Kale. In this particular video, we will be taking a look at the following question where we have to find out the right way of phrasing the underlying portion of the sentence. Renowned for his contributions to the field of investigative journalism, Brian Deere worked on both the Michael Briggs case in 1986 as well as the Andrew Wakefield case which led to the retraction of Wakefield's fraudulent research on the link between autism and vaccines in Lancet. So essentially he worked on two cases and it has been introduced as both the Michael Briggs case as well as the Andrew Wakefield case. The general format for using both is both X and Y. The format is not both x as well as y. Both x as well as y is incorrect usage. So, the this form, this current usage is incorrect because you should just say both x and y. So, as well as we can eliminate option A and C are eliminated. Now, let us take a look at option E also and also is given. 
uh, the x and y should have exactly same format. So, both all uh, if you have both x and y, here you cannot add also y as such. This uh, formation is also incorrect. X and Y should have parallel construction. The use of also makes it not, uh, it makes it a parallelism error. So, this is also eliminated. So, you have uh, two options and on the Wakefield case and the Andrew Wakefield case. X and Y should have the same structure as such. In the first case, you have both the Michael Briggs case and second is the Andrew Wakefield case. On is not given over here. There is no on over here. So, on is also not correct over here as such because both should have parallel construction. If it was both on the uh, Michael Briggs case and on the Andrew Wakefield case, that would have been fine. But since on is not used over here, it cannot be used in the second part or the parallel uh, sentence also. So, only option D is correct because it uh, follows the parallel structure of sentences. So, the correct answer is option D. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT points video series. In this particular video, we will be taking a look at a uh, critical reasoning question which is asking us to identify the assumption that is to be that has been made in the uh, argument as such. Studies have shown that individuals who have access to a good education are more likely to succeed in their chosen careers and attain higher levels of income. Therefore, it is important for governments and society to ensure that all individuals regardless of their background have the opportunity to receive a good education. This will not only benefit the individual, but also contribute to the development of a thriving and productive society. So, essentially what exactly is being uh, meant over here? The, uh, the uh, studies have observed a correlation between uh, having a good education and having good uh, uh, income levels. Those who have good education seem to have good income levels and vice versa. Essentially, uh, good education leads to good in income levels. And uh, because of that, what they are saying is that society and government should ensure that everybody has an access to a good education because then as a whole, uh, an individual will not only be benefited, but as a whole, the society will also be benefited from it. So, this is like the, uh, this is the base or this is the initial fact on and on basis of this, uh, this is the conclusion that good education will lead to good income levels and it will lead to the benefit of society and therefore a recommendation is made that we should prioritize or essentially uh, we should uh, support education as a government and society should support education. Now, uh, we have to identify which of the assumptions has been made in this particular reasoning but one of the things that I can observe right off hand is that uh, a Correlation is given which is that okay these are the ones who have a good education are more likely to succeed that is a correlation that is some, uh, something that is observed as such and that essentially is uh, then changed to a causation that if you give good education levels to everybody it will lead to good income levels for everyone. Now, we do not know whether the causation works or not just because a correlation exists we do not know whether a causation works or not. Again. Uh, we do not know that the good education for necessarily will create good income levels or something else might be a common factor which leads to both of them being the case. That is if somebody is already rich to begin with, they might have a good education as well as good income levels because they would have opportunities, not just educational opportunities but job opportunities that would lead to good income levels as such. So, we do not know uh, whether this uh, is just a correlation or a causation. So, there I see an underlying assumption that this correlation is not just a correlation, it is causation. Second thing I would say is that when we are uh, trying to identify assumptions, the try method that I use is I uh, negate the assumption. If I say that the assumption is not true, is our conclusion invalidated? If the conclusion is not invalidated, if the recommended step or recommended action is not invalidated, then the conclusion stands, then it is not an assumption. If the recommended step is invalidated, the conclusion is invalidated, then it is definitely an assumption that you have to make. Uh, that is basically how we identify if the assumption is not true, the conclusion will no longer stand. So, let us take a look at the options. A higher level of income is desirable primarily because it contributes to the development of a thriving and productive society. Now, let us refute this assumption. Suppose it is desirable not only for the societal benefit, but for the individual themselves that you want a higher level of income for the betterment of the individual. Suppose that is the case. Now, if that is the case, does your, uh, uh, does your uh, argument get invalidated? No, because if the individual is benefited, even if that is the primary cause or primary motivation as such, the fact that it has a secondary effect, positive effect on society is not invalidated as such. And because it is not invalidated, 
the recommended step or recommended course of action is also not invalidated which means that even if your primary concern is not the society but the individual it does not matter to the final conclusion as such so a is not an assumption that is being made the only way for individuals to succeed in their chosen careers and attain higher income levels is by receiving a good education now suppose i invalidate it when you say only way the way to invalidate it by is by saying that there are other ways so suppose there are other ways of succeeding and attaining higher income level suppose you can start a business or you can do something uh, where you can attain a higher income level without having a good education but does that invalidate this particular uh, scenario where giving good education will lead to good income levels no there might be other ways but this is definitely one way and if you increase the number of people who have a good education you are increasing the number of people with good income levels and that benefit society as a whole so even if there are other ways if this way works the conclusion stands the course of action stands so b does not invalidate our conclusion so b is not an assumption let's consider option c education plays a more significant role than other factors such as an individual's background household income level or geography now suppose i invalidate this factor that education does not play a more significant role what plays a bigger significant role when it comes to income levels is like suppose it is the individual's background how rich or poor they are uh, by default or what their household income level was when they were growing up or where they are from if your geography also matters where whether you are from the richer areas or from the poor areas even if i give you a good education if all of those factors are not fixed that good education is not going to lead to good income levels so if this particular uh, Uh, assumption if i say that this is uh, not true then my causation link does not work anymore that there are other important factors at play which will prevent that causal uh, causation from working which would prevent good education from leading to good income levels and if that is the case then my course of action does not make any sense if uh, 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 if the person's background makes all the difference if the person's household income makes all the difference then my focus on education is uh, misplaced because all of those other factors would play more uh, would play a bigger role in whether the or not the person achieves higher income level or not so c essentially if you invalidate the assumption your course of action no longer would have the desired effect so c is a definitely an assumption being ma being made by the author so i would say c is the right answer but let's take a look at options d and e as well society and government are the only entities responsible for providing education now let's invalidate it there are other people private players who are also providing education does that mean that the society and government have no role to play no the fact that there are private players does not mean that the society and government has no role to play the society and government still has a big role to play even if there are private players so d does not in any way invalidate the conclusion because the society and government's role would all still be central or essential even if there are other players as such let's take a look at option e every individual should pursue a formal education regardless of their interests and passions now if this is not true okay for example if i invalidate it that every individual need not pursue a formal uh, education suppose there are some people who are say uh, interested in business or interested in arts where a formal education is not needed now that does not invalidate a case that i am making for the vast majority of the po uh, population for a vast majority of the population it is important for them to have a formal education so that that formal education good education will lead to good income levels the exceptions do not break the rule as such the exceptions would mean that they don't need formal education but as a society i should prioritize and support good education so that those people who take the advantage of good education have good income levels so e even if i invalidate uh, uh it the entire uh, course of action is not invalidated as such only c has that impact so c is an assumption being made Hi friends welcome to Gmat points video series i'm Saili Kale in this particular video we have a uh, critical reasoning question where we have to find out uh, which conclusion can be made so a conclusion is not given we have to identify based on the information based on the premise which conclusion necessarily follows so let's take a look at the uh, paragraph just as picking apples from a tree becomes harder after you ha after you harvest the low hanging fruit science becomes harder after researchers solve the easiest mysteries this must be true in some cases uh this must be true in some cases calculating gravity in the 1600 basically required a telescope pen and paper discovering the higgs boson in the 21st century requires uh, required constructing a 10 billion dollar particle collider and spending billions more firing subatomic particles at one another at near light speed 
So what is being mentioned over here? So basically, when you are like uh, picking trees, uh, picking apples from the tree, uh, it's easy to take the low hanging fruit because you can just uh, reach up and you can take it. But if you have to now, after you have picked the low hanging fruit, to actually climb up uh, and uh, pick fruit from the upper parts of the tree, it takes more effort, it takes more time and effort as such to reach the upper limits of the tree. So that uh, that is acting as a metaphor for uh, scientific discovery. The same way as uh, uh, in, when, in early days of scientific discoveries, there were a lot of low hanging fruit which you could easily uh, pick and you could actually uh, like uh, uh, you could discover as such and like uh, picking the low hanging fruit from an apple tree, it was inexpensive to actually discover them. It would not take a lot of time, effort or money to discover that. But now that you have picked all the low hanging fruit in the 21st century to discover anything as such, you need much more effort, much more time, much more money than the earlier discoveries. Because now you have reached the upper limits of the apple tree. To reach or pick an apple from the top of the apple tree requires lot more effort than to pick an apple from the bottom of the apple tree. So similarly, to now make scientific discoveries in 21st century is much more difficult, much more expensive much more intensive than to make scientific discoveries in the 16th century. That is essentially like this is uh, apple trees is being uh, compared to uh, picking things from apple trees is being compared to uh, making scientific discoveries as such. So what we can essentially infer is that if you have to make scientific discoveries in the 21st century, it is going to take more effort uh, in terms of time, money and everything than if it would have taken to make scientific discoveries, any kind of scientific discovery in the 16th century. They will not be the same discoveries because now the discoveries you are making are at the much more advanced level than the discoveries that were made in 16th century as such. So now that you understand the paragraph and its conclusions, let's take a look at the options. As scientific discoveries progress, the methods and technology required to make further discoveries becomes more advanced and costly. This is true from the example as well as from the metaphor given that is as you make more progress to actually reach the higher uh, this you have to spend more time and mo more money to reach the uh, higher this so the methods become difficult the methods become costly and more advanced and the technology required also becomes more costly and advanced so this is something that can be inferred as scientific uh, progress occurs uh, you have to spend more time more money and more effort to actually make the same uh, discoveries as uh, make uh, new discoveries as such so a is a conclusion that can be drawn let's take a look at options b c d e the difficulty of picking apples from a tree is quite similar to the advancement of scientific discoveries no the difficulty is uh, used as a metaphor it's not that this is the same this difficulty is the same as that difficulty it is super easy for us to even like climb up a tree and pick up from the top of an apple tree but to build a 10 by a billion dollar uh, uh, particle collider is much much more difficult these two difficulties are not even on the same level of difficulty as such so b is clearly incorrect the cost of scientific discoveries will continue to increase indefinitely. So that is not the point that it will continue to increase indefinitely. The point is that it takes a lot more time and effort. Money is just a factor that goes in. Essentially, uh, the uh, money is an indicative of how much effort is required. It's not that the cost will increase indefinitely, but it was essentially uh, money, time and effort are all increasing over time. It's taking more time to do it, more money to do it, more effort to do it. So it's not that the cost will continue to increase indefinitely. It might not be cost that increases, but it might be time that increases, it might be effort that increases. So C is incorrect as such. The discovery of gravity in the 1600s was more, diffi more difficult than the discovery of Higgs boson in the 21st century. This is clearly opposite of what is actually given in the paragraph. In the paragraph, it is basically mentioned that the difficulty of the methods and technology that we are using now is much, much higher. Uh, we, have, we have to spend a lot of money, lot of time and uh, like build a huge particle collider to make discoveries today. So this is opposite of what the act author is actually implying as such. So D is incorrect. The cost of constructing scientific tools is directly proportional to the complexity of the scientific discovery being made. Not to. Firstly, it's not about the complexity of the scientific discovery made. The cost of the tool is shown as an indicator of how difficult it is. It's not uh, that it will proportionately rise. Okay, you are making a 2x more complex discovery, so it will become 2x. That is not the point. That is not a. Uh, uh, that is not the relationship that is established by anything in the passage as such. They are only mentioning how expensive things are getting to show how difficult things are getting. So E is also not the correct conclusion. A is the only correct conclusion. So the correct option to choose is option A.
Hi friends, welcome to GMAT Points video series. I'm Saili Kale. In this particular uh, uh, critical reasoning question, we have a question where we are uh, asked to find out which of the following options would actually support the argument made by the critics of a particular study. So let's take a look at the uh, paragraph. A recent study conducted by researchers at a leading university found that the use of cell phones while driving increases the risk of car accidents by four times. The study analyzed data from thousands of car accidents and found that drivers who were using their cell phones at the time of the accident were four times more likely to be involved in a collision compared to drivers who were not using their phones. However, some experts have argued that the study's conclusion is based on flawed methodology. They point out that the study relied on self-reported data, which is often subject to bias and inaccuracies. So, a study is mentioned and the uh, result of the study is mentioned. But the experts are saying that this study, these stu this study's results are invalid because the way that study was conducted was wrong. The methodology of that particular study is wrong because it rep uh, relies on self-reporting. The people who are making that study are not taking, uh, they are not taking the information. They are relying on the information that is reported by the person who was in the accident. And they are saying that this is not the correct way of conducting a study. This will introduce bias and it will, uh, it would invalidate the results as such. That is their contention. So, we have to find out which of the following if true would support the argument made by the expert. So, which of the following options would actually uh, support the uh, argument that the methodol methodology followed by the study is flawed. So, let us take a look at the options. The study was funded by a major cell phone company and therefore may have influenced the financial bias. This would weaken the study's results, definitely. But it would not show why the methodology is flawed. You can take funds from somebody and still conduct a proper study as such. So, how do you, this does not really indicate that uh, the methodology followed in the study was incorrect. So, A is not really making, uh, adding uh, support to the claims made by the expert. It is just weakening the study without bolstering the claim of the experts as such. Uh, the study did not take into account other possible contributing factors that could have led to accidents such as weather conditions, road conditions or the driver's level of fatigue. Now, this is a valid concern. Because essentially, whenever you are conducting any kind of study and you are saying A leads to B, you have to essentially account for other factors, other factors remaining same. So, if in the case of accidents, other factors were not same, then you can't make that conclusion. So, essentially, when you say that, okay, a, uh, an increase in cell phone usage led to more road accidents, you have to basically say, now uh, controlling for the same level of driver fatigueness, controlling for the same geographical factors, controlling for the same weather conditions. If weather conditions in one set of cases were different from the other set of cases, then you cannot make the argument that uh, cell phones caused the accidents. Essentially, if they did not control for these important variables, the methodology followed by the study is flawed because they did not follow a scientific methodology for the study. In any kind of scientific study, you have to, if you are saying that A leads to B, you have to essentially control for the remaining variables that could also impact B. So, if the other variables have not been controlled, the methodology is flawed and then this actually makes, uh, supports the claim of the experts that the people who conducted the study did not do a proper job of it. So, B would be the right answer, but let us also take a look at C, D and E. The study only analyzed data from a small number of car accidents, making it difficult to draw any meaningful conclusions. Now, even if this is correct, that 1000 is not in a large enough number, you can then say that, okay, uh, uh, this will need to be reported at a large, uh, redone at a larger scale. But the authors are not saying that this needs to be redone at a larger scale. They are saying that the way this was conducted, the methodology of the, its conduct was wrong. So, if they are saying the methodology was wrong, it is not about the number of cases that were studied, but how they were studied as such. So, C is not capturing the flawed methodology. D is saying the study was conducted by a leading university in a different country where laws regarding cell phone use while driving are different. Even if this is the case, you can say that, okay, that study is not applicable to me because the laws there are different. But you are not then saying that that study is wrong in itself, its methodology is wrong in itself. So, D, say, D will question the applicability of the study without casting doubt at the methodology of the study. So, again D is not the right answer. The study only analyzed data from one specific region and therefore may not be applicable to other areas with different driving conditions. E has the same issue as D. E is talking about applicability. Can we generalize to all areas? No. There are certain, uh, this basically means that, okay, this study though valid cannot be widely applied. Even if that is the case, then even then you are saying that the uh, study is still valid as such. 
here the experts are saying that the study's results are invalid because it was not done properly as such. So, E also does not make that claim, only B actually highlights why the methodology was flawed and therefore it supports the arguments made by the experts. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT points video series. In this particular question, we are asked to find out the right sentence for ending or completing the given paragraph. So, let us take a look at the paragraph. From 2020 to 2022, the total value of buy now pay later or BNPL loans originated in the US, United States grew more than 1000% from $2 billion to $24.2 billion. That is still a fra small fraction of the amount charged to credit cards, but the fast adoption of BNPL points to its mainstream appeal. The widespread embrace of this kind of lending system says a lot about Americans' relationship to debt, particularly among the young bo younger borrowers who made BNPL popular. So, essentially the entire paragraph is about the rising prop, uh, popularity of BNPL loans and how this essentially points out to Americans uh, relationship with debt and it is basically saying that uh, this BNPL loan shows that uh, there is a demand for that particular type of loan among the uh, uh, younger segment as such, the younger borrowers who made the BNPL uh, uh, popular as such. So, it is a rising market that is essentially been con conveyed by this particular paragraph. To complete the paragraph, you have to essentially close this chain of thought that BNPL is rising fast, it is a rising category and it is especially popular among the younger borrowers. So, everything that is there in the last sentence should essentially uh, continue with this particular thought of its rising popularity and especially among the younger borrowers and bring it to a close. So, let us take a look at the options. It is known that, uh, it is known however that BNPL is only used by people with bad credit as they are unable to obtain traditional loans. Now, if this is the case, it would not show a distinct level of uh, popularity among the younger borrowers. If you say it is just younger borrowers, then it is not necessary people with uh, bad credit as such because people with bad credit are there at all different age ranges. Moreover, the entire passage is about the rising industry that is, uh, the industry that is expanding and growing. It is not about uh, what, uh, uh, who exactly is attracted to these type of loans. So, A is incorrect. It is not consistent with what is actually being mentioned in the paragraph which talks about how this has become very popular among the younger users. So, A is incorrect. The majority of BNPL loans are used to purchase luxury items such as de designer clothing and jewellery. Now, the use of the BNPL loans is not mentioned. What is being mentioned is their uh, wide acceptance, growing audience and especially uh, quick spread among the younger borrowers. The actual usage of the funds is not being discussed over here. So, this would be a completely tangential point to what is being discussed till now. So, B actually sets off on an entirely different discussion. So, that would not be a good continuation for what is there in the paragraph as such. Uh, C is the BNPL industry might experience a decline in the next few, year, uh, few years as consumers in the 20 plus age group become more cautious about taking on a dip. Now, this might be true, but this should not be at the ending point of this particular sentence. You first talk about its expansion, about its appeal and later on somewhere in 2-3 paragraphs down, you might actually say that, okay, you know what, 20 years from now, it might have a decline. But right now, you are talking about an expanding market. And this is not in line with that because this talks about much, much ahead in time while the remaining paragraph only talks about what is happening now and its rising popularity now. So, this is not in the same, uh, this won't be in the same paragraph as the uh, given sentences. So, C would be maybe in a paragraph much, much later in the passage as such. Uh, Let us take a look at option D. It was found that most people that use buy now, pay later in the 18 to 30 age group either do not have a credit card or are often unable to source loans via traditional means. Now, this adds value to the original paragraph. It explains why it is so popular among younger borrowers. It completes a chain of thought. This is widely expanding and it is especially popular among younger borrowers because they do not have the credit cards, they do not have access to traditional loans. So, D essentially completes the chain of thought and gives you a coherent thought that this is widely expanding among younger borrowers because of this reason. So, D actually adds like uh, uh, links to the last line that is mentioned. It completes a full chain of thought and that is why D should be the ideal uh, sentence to end the particular paragraph. Let us take a look at option E as well. Some note that the majority of BNPL loans are used to purchase expensive electronic devices such as smartphones and laptops. E for the same reason as B is the uh, incorrect, E is uh, incorrect for the same reason, the usage has not been discussed till now. 
the usage has not been the focus of discussion till now. So, putting a information about the usage in the last line does not make sense. It is, would be a different paragraph entirely, not part of this particular paragraph. D would be the right sentence to choose. Hi friends, welcome to GMAT points video series. In this particular video, I will be discussing a, uh, uh, we have to identify what could be a source of a discrepancy. Observe. So, let us first take a look at what is a discrepancy. The Affordable Care Act ACA was introduced in 2010 to provide better access to healthcare for all individuals, regardless of income or pre-existing conditions. It provided subsidies to purchase private insurance and mandated employers to provide insurance healthcare coverage for all uh, for employees at all levels. The ACA was intended to provide a solution for the high number of uninsured Americans and make healthcare more affordable and accessible for all. However, after the ACA was implemented, there has been a rise in the number of uninsured Americans. According to the US Census Bureau, the number of uninsured Americans increased by 2 million between 2012 and 2013. So, what exactly is the issue? So, the ACA was essentially intro, uh, introduced to make sure more people are insured, that there isn't a lot of people who are denied insurance on the basis of pre-existing conditions, etc., that it becomes more affordable and accessible to all. But what was actually observed, instead of a decrease in the number of in, uninsured, there was an increase in the number of uninsured. So, you have to find out why the ACA did not actually meet its objective and in fact, the number of uninsured grew instead of falling. So, let us take a look at the options. Uh, a number of people chose not to enroll in the healthcare coverage. If this is the case, then the number should stay the same. The number of people who chose not to in, uh, enroll would stay the same before or after ACA. If they were choosing not because of the ACA or any impact of the ACA as such, you can't explain why the number increased as such. Here you have to see uh, for certain factor that would explain why after implementing the ACA, the number actually increased. So, there was some kind of a negative impact of the ACA on the number of insured uh, this and no such negative impact is mentioned in A. So, A can be eliminated. The number of uninsured individuals was already high before the ACA was implemented. Even if this was the case, they would stay the same before and after ACA. But what is observed is the number of uninsured increased. Now, you have to basically explain why that increased occur and B does not give a reason for that increase as such. So, B is also eliminated. Some employers chose not to provide healthcare coverage for their employees. Again, if they did not provide healthcare coverage, they that uh, healthcare coverage under employers was not there earlier. So, again, some even if some did not uh, provide, some would have provided, and in fact, if not uh, decrease, at least it would have stayed the same. But if it did uh, increase, then it is something which has actually had a negative impact and unintended negative consequence. And even if some employees did not give uh, health insurance, it would not increase as such. The number of uninsured would not increase because of this. So, C is also incorrect. There was no mandate to require individuals to enroll, enroll in health coverage. Again, A, B, C, D all give you examples of why it should remain stagnant. If the mandate was not there, there would be no impact. The number of uninsured would stay the same. Why did it increase? So, D also is not giving a reason for that. So, D also can be eliminated. Insurance companies raise premium out of pocket costs, making coverage unaffordable to some individuals. Now, this is giving you a direct negative consequence of ACA. Because of this, they increase the premiums, they increase the out of pocket costs, which means that those who already had insurance, they were no longer able to afford insurance and then they became uninsured. So, why was there a rise in the number of uninsured? Because people who had insurance were no longer able to afford that insurance. So, E is the only one give, which gives you an explanation for an increase in the number of uninsured. So, E is the right answer.